We are Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing episodes of the Walking Dead universe. Sometimes we give you news, sometimes we make you laugh, but most times we make deep, we make deep. Here's some deep for you to put your pita and hummus in. <laughs> anyway, so we're talking about the seventh episode in the final season of The Walking Dead called <sighs> Promises Broken. All of these titles thus far sound a lot like, like song titles or song lyrics. So like Out of the Ashes rendition yeah or like album titles essentially what did you guys think of this episode because i thought this was pretty phenomenal that we were able to follow three different in 3.1 different story tracks and it all kind of cohese yeah. and they all kind of play with one another in a weird way but what did you guys think uh starting with sharon because i will leave the spice for last <laughs> I thought it was awesome. I mean, last week's was good. I just didn't have a whole lot to say about last week's. But this week, I have a lot of things to say. Uh, I loved it. I loved, of course, the Maggie Negan interaction. Tension. It was funny. <laughs> I liked the uh, the Commonwealth stuff. That was funny. Funny too. I have something to bring up later about the Commonwealth stuff that has got me very curious. All right, spicy one. Overall, I liked the episode. There were a lot of good moments. The things I had issues with were so minor and had no effect on the actual storyline whatsoever. This is just me nitpicking at little things and, and that's it. But, but but it seems to be burrowing into your brain. It seems to be affecting you. <laughs> it's okay. When we start talking about it, maybe, maybe you'll agree with me. Maybe you won't. I don't know. But it's just <sighs> stupid things that I feel like. We are we are this far in the apocalypse, so there are certain things that we sh as fans just shouldn't allow to happen anymore. And I saw it in this episode, and it just ah, bothered me. Okay, That's I think, all. <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about now. Okay, fine. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> Before we continue, <laughs> I thought I think it's best to kind of go over the last 24 hours because in that 24 hours we've been churning out so much content, it's just almost gross. <laughs> uh, but primarily, we actually finally released the watch party of The Old Ways, starring Bridget Callie Canales, who played Rachel on Fear of the Walking Dead. It was great. It was great to finally have released. Uh, Sharon did, did the editing for it. Thank you very much for that, because I would not have done it. I, would not have, I, I redid the editing for that. <laughs> Okay. No, I didn't do I didn't do anything for the watch party. Not basically nothing at all except for sound leveling stuff. And then right after that we premiered separately the Q&A which I ended up using as a separate podcast episode. So, if you are listening on audio only, that episode is 151 which we released just last night. We released the the social media relating to it and so it's available on all podcast platforms. So, you can either watch that on YouTube and see Chris Allender, the director of The Old Ways who happened to join us for both the watch party and to stick around afterwards to answer awesome. questions so uh, awesome. it, and it was very informative we edited it majorly down from like i think like almost close to 40 minutes to like 18 <laughs> so uh it, give it a listen it's one of the shortest squawking dead episodes you'll ever listen to so uh you know enjoy <laughs> that oh also right after that because of course we can't not do something uh we actually announced the winner of kirk manley's uh season 10 season 11 tribute art giveaway weekend quote unquote mm -hmm. uh, that happened to be tracy streeter from twitter and instagram congratulations, I know from everywhere. Tracy. congratulations. Yay. she won a, uh kirk's complete set of prints released that weekend and the three sketch cards that he actually did now these are hand drawn for each person that actually participated in buying those prints over the weekend for each day etc so if you bought two prints a day let's say you got all three sketch cards or if you bundled the whole thing you got all three sketch cards but if you just bought one print you didn't get it if you just bought the other print you didn't get it you know so you had to fulfill certain criteria but Tracy got all six prints, all three sketch cards, and the limited exclusive signed and numbered event poster, which is something that Kirk is very well known for, considering his work with Walker Stalker and all these other con conventions. So congratulations. We, yeah, so that's a live stream we did last night, which almost got botched too. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but thank you for hanging around, fellow co-hosts and people in tow. Let me read Aiden's take for a second, though. Aiden also loved the episode, made a lot of ground in the Commonwealth, introduced some interesting characters, showed great development for Leah and Eugene. Mm -hmm. so that was pretty interesting too. I kind of feel the same way as Aiden. I, again, I, I like that they were able to keep these storylines moving without feeling like Game of Thrones, essentially. <laughs> like 
we're we're mm-hmm. constantly zooming around between different types of storylines. And they're like, oh, I completely forgot about this other storyline. Like, no, it, there seems to be a good flow going. They seem to relate to one another in a certain sense. You know, lies being a, a bit of a, a theme here. Mm-hmm. Not lying versus lying. Who lies to whom? Who is saying what? Unspoken lies. A lie of omission. Let's get the Negan and Maggie shit out of the way. <laughs> 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 Please. You know, I, I can't see very well. Is that a whole bottle of vodka going into your cup? <laughs> yeah, if we're starting with Maggie and Negan, I need all the vodka. <laughs> I, I applaud your, your commitment <laughs> to alcoholism. I'm kidding. It's a water bottle. <laughs> Actually, though, she, you haven't seen her play Jackbox games. <laughs> <laughs> That's How many? Two bottles in one night, if I remember correctly, one time. That, Am okay. I right? That we started day drinking. That we started in the middle of the day that day. So I had a lot of time. Yes, it was two bottles of wine. <laughs> How do I say this without sounding like I like Negan? Hmm. He had a lot of really good things to say. And or I things even, that struck you as like well, sure, that and hit you. Yeah, and I even I even said this <laughs> to Sharon Day when we were watching the episode. Negan is a lot of things. But he's also honest. He's an honest asshole. So the things that he's saying to Maggie are, sure, hard to hear. But I don't know. I feel like at least he's being honest with her. And the honesty is going to pay off, I think. Even though Maggie hates his guts, I think she understands the value of his honesty as well. Is she going to forgive him? I I don't, I don't, I I won't. I'm not going to forgive him. So why would Maggie, but. Well, there's like a, like a value in knowing where someone stands, right? If, if they don't give you anything at all, like if let's just say a politician, right? I'm just going to throw it out there, but like, let's say a politician, but Mm -hmm. if anything, yeah, they may not come through with their promises, but they mean what, or at least they, they're going to, I don't know who we're talking about here. <laughs> who better to as a foil for Negan's honesty than Lance Hornsby, mm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about, again, I'm going to say this a lot. Sorry, Aiden, my bad. <laughs> but the yin-yang thing has never been more present than in this episode. And it makes me crazy because my nose is about to bleed. I'm about to burst <laughs> capillaries just thinking about it. Because, yeah, I mean, we look at Lance Hornsby and he's the exact opposite of Negan. Mm-hmm. Lance says, awesome thing. Like, th- mm-hmm. hey, I can help you out. Hey, come right come right this way. There's a thing I need you to do. And, you know, you'll be on your feet. And you'll be out of here before you know it. <laughs> Next scene, Eugene in jail. <laughs> so, and then, but like, at least with Negan, he's giving her the straight talk. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's one thing in this world that you can count, at least count on with Negan, is he's the only one who doesn't seem to be lying on this show, period. Yeah. Maggie's lying to Negan by saying, hey, I might break my promise Well, of not killing you. Apparently it's something that was discussed in a couple episodes back. Yeah, but does, does she ever agree to that promise? I mean, she tells Elijah, I hope I can keep my promise. Right. Well, she so, shook his hand. I mean, right. he said, yeah, he was okay. like, you know, do that, we have yeah. a girl? And she was like, yeah, she shook his hand. Yeah, that's true. I keep true. thinking about that scene with Rick in the, in the bar. A man's as uh, good at his word. The smile yeah. that Negan gives her after she shakes his hand is frightening. <laughs> that yeah. was a Negan smile. Yes, Ooh, what yes, did you yes. Do, Maggie? <laughs> it's like it's like you open the genie out of the bottle, and and he's like, oh, finally I can flex my muscles. <laughs> so what do you want, huh? <laughs> what are your three <laughs> wishes? He's been looking over his shoulder and he trusts Maggie. Enough. And that's the weird thing, okay? The one thing you can count on with Negan is to give him, is, is to get the unvarnished truth, right? Maybe even a playful truth. But the one thing Negan can count on on Maggie is that she is a woman of her word. According to him, I don't know if that's true in, in, in terms of Walking Dead canon, but I mean, as far as I can tell, yeah. What did you think about what I just said, though? That you, you can rely on Negan for the un- unvarnished truth, but Negan is relying, like literally which allows him to smile. He's relying on Maggie being true to her word. Do you, I, okay, yes, I know they shook hands, they they made an, an agreement, but do you really think Negan trusts Maggie? I, I, st- I still think he's going to be looking over his shoulder. Oh, I think Negan does. The question really is, do we think Maggie's going to keep her promise? That I'm, is a, that's because Negan seems yeah. to be all in. It's it's what makes him allows him to be to like relax a little. Like the, until this point, he's like Maggie. I'm just gonna like, can we just go, Maggie? Hey, Maggie. Hey, yeah. Not to be the annoying guy. I, just, I don't mean to talk out of turn, but this is a stupid plan. Like, but like as soon as he <laughs> shakes her hand, it's like hey, it's like he's literally Robin the genie. <laughs> he's like yeah, a genie he, in Aladdin. He's like his his demeanor changed, but yeah, I, completely. To me, that's not convincing me that he fully trusts her. I think he's too, for lack of a better word, smart to not keep a side eye on her, right? I mean, 
he values his life. He's not going to take chances. I'd he's, say that he's on his way, right? I think we can break even there. Like, he's if he can feel to relaxed. To her? Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. yeah. If his demeanor changes that much. He started a path of trust between the two of them, and he's, you know, they've taken the first step. Right. So I think he's ready to kind of continue down that path. If, as long mm -hmm. as he can be useful to her and help her in her mission, I think he's going to feel safe around her. And maybe this is like the one thing where, remember when he was saying people, or I don't know, some, somebody was saying people can change, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe what Negan was proposing with Maggie was less about a promise to him that he she wouldn't kill him. But maybe it was more of a beginning of what it could look like to show her that he's changed. Mm -hmm. And even Elijah remarked this, does this guy change? And it's, it's like, you know, well, right. he's changed in as much as Negan be Neganing, right? That's yeah. essentially what she he said. He didn't say no. <laughs> right. right. Just right. like she didn't say anything when she kind of shook his hand. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? So like, there's a little bit of funkiness, yin-yanginess coming going on there too. Yeah. Well, and this is just further proof that Maggie has talked about Negan to her people because, I mean, Elijah even seems to, like, know him, right? Like, yeah. this isn't the guy you described to me. That much is true. Like, mm -hmm. definitely that is true because we noticed that from the looks that he was that, that her crew was giving him. But mm -hmm. what it did confirm was that Negan was right, that Maggie had intended on killing him. This is something we weren't 100% oh, yeah. sure about. We weren't sure about it at all. Even Maggie, Maggie admitting it was kind of like, ah, eh, you know, I think about killing you all the time, but like, really, do I? But not oh, only I believed did, her. <laughs> but not only did she think about doing it, but she told her people that she would, mm -hmm. right? Which is weird, right? It's easy to do when he's out of sight, you know? Yeah, if I ever see him again, I'm going to kill that motherfucker, you know? Yeah. <laughs> the irony of that statement being that like, okay, who kind of sort of did the same thing? Leah, probably bad mouthed Daryl on the side. Like, she's going, that motherfucker, I gave him an opportunity, and yeah, then, at, like, went back to her crew. Carver's at least to Carver. At, yeah. Yeah, she at least talked shit about Daryl to Carver. Yeah. That's yep. pretty obvious. Yeah, there you go. And so, right. But going back to Maggie, but it's weird, right? Because didn't Maggie kind of settle on the fact that this guy was kind of trash before she ran off? Literally before she ran off when Rick died, oh, yeah. quote unquote. Yeah. The pathetic puddle of nothingness that he was before she left. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. we have to kind of figure out why the sudden change. Like, because here's the thing. She doesn't know that Negan was let out. You don't mean now. You meant before During this when whole... she was away. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So gotcha, gotcha. What, may, what changed that? What happened here? Or... Or could this be one of those Sherry situations where, like, she's like, oh, you're just not less than nothing. That man that killed my husband is, is no longer here. He died when the sanctuary fell or something like that. So, mm -hmm. but what changed? Is this a Sherry thing? Is she is she doing the same thing? Pinning all the disappointments and destruction of her people mm -hmm. time and time again. But then the last one being the big straw. Is she, like, putting that all on Negan now? Unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm saying what changed, right? This is something we have to settle. Because now it's happened. Now it's here. Now it's real. And it's something that she discussed with her people it could just be a matter of talking about it and bringing it up again and reliving all those feelings you know she thought she was over it but the more she talked about it it's like Ooh, i'm i'm really not over this so you're saying it's recent rather than over t having talked to her people about it over time yeah and i think her coming okay. back and seeing negan out and about remember how pissed sharon D was to see dakota walking around the dam i mean this is what neat <laughs> this is what maggie came home to this killer who killed her husband is walking around free. So, I mean, that right there could have snapped her into mm -hmm. revenge mode. Right. In the time that it took for her to arrive, save people in the tower, settle into mm -hmm. Alexandria. Well, I mean, to, out, right, of, gotcha. out of sight, out of mind, she's been gone. She hasn't been, mm -hmm. I mean, she's been thinking about him, but he hasn't been right there in her face. Now okay. he's right there in her face. That settles yeah. it for me. That settles it for right me. There in her face. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I have a theory, Aiden says, maybe Maggie will keep her promise, but Herschel will kill, be the one to kill Negan. Yeah, and like for all our talk about like that. Negan, sorry, Herschel being a piece of shit uh, in the comics, not in the show. Sorry, That's, that's later. That's that's later. <laughs> Much he's, later, right, right. He's right. an ass when he grows up. Much like, uh, what's his face? Sebastian. <laughs> what, what do you think about that theory, though? I like it. I think it would be poetic justice. Right, I guess it would be coming out of nowhere. Mm. And it yeah. really would be. I mean, do you, we, we all know Negan loves children children i mean then, he he likes kids so he would probably avoid herschel right i mean that 
why would he want to be know. around him? Like He doesn't right? seem to be avoiding Maggie. He didn't like, really have a choice there, though. <laughs> he was recruited into this mission. and But Herschel, that would be very surprising. I don't think he would expect a child to try and kill him. Of oh, course, oh, Carl oh, did. Oh, but I see what you're saying. Judith is training him. Yeah. For the interesting yeah. reason. What kind <laughs> of bad blood would it bring up between Judith and, and Herschel, though? Because Judith That's loves exactly him. what I was going to ask. Yeah. I yeah. mean... That wouldn't. That would kind of bring up some uh, some some bad blood. I think you get into the circle of oh he killed Negan and now we got to kill somebody else and I got to kill somebody else. You get into that freaking revenge mm. circle, which mm-hmm. we're sort of looking at right now. Like okay, I kind of want to take it back to Aaron now because what I saw in Aaron is exactly what I see in Pope, and it scares the hell out of me. Because one of the things that Pope says when Leah encounters that survivor out in the you know, next to the house of the where they're scouting and all that stuff, Leah checks in with Pope and goes, "Hey, how should we engage?" And Pope says. Yeah, kill him. Like, what are you? What are you dumb? <laughs> but then I see. I go back to Aaron at Hilltop with the with the Whisperer remainders, and I'm thinking, oh, that could have happened had Carol not stepped in. They Jerry, oh God, Jerry and Aaron would have killed them all. And then you, we're talking about Negan in this episode, and Negan says, oh, I would have done things different. I would have killed you all. And it gets you thinking. That's what the natural conclusion is. And literally, the Reapers are like the if allowed to run its natural course. That's what people should quote unquote do right because if everything is a threat and and everything becomes a worse and worse threat and people devolve into whatever then negan is essentially saying yeah i should have been smarter and i shouldn't have been like because negan is trying to explain to maggie i was too benevolent i killed one maybe two in a special case just to make an example so i can save the rest of you he's like i was too i was too nice i should have killed all of you i was too enamored with you (laughs) It's like, you guys were my pet project. Oh, I'm going to make savers out of all of you. Be my biggest achievement. But he was either too vain or, but I think, I don't know, maybe that part of him that wants to save people. Like I think it was part vanity too, though. Honestly, I think he saw Rick as a challenge and he wanted to beat this challenge. He wanted to win him, like you said, make them all saviors. He wanted to break Rick down. Even that shows a shred of humanity. What is ambition in a world that's dead? What is personality in a world that's dead? What is wanting something that's outside of survival and thrive? You know, what is what is that? And then we look at the Reapers and it's kill, kill, kill. Yeah, we have to kill them all so that they don't think about coming back. If they even think back fondly to, to the place that we, they used to live, we have to kill them so they don't think of that. Pope is right. Okay, they that's are. what I was going to ask next. Because Leah says this too. Are. They are coming back to try and reclaim Meridian. <laughs> they are still a threat. <laughs> and they're on the way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, he, he's correct about the motivations, right? Like, I mean, as a person, <laughs> he is just ca- cuckoo bananas. Oh, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> crazy. But he makes that, Teddy look sane. <laughs> but, that, okay. that, but that yin-yang-ness of that conversation between Negan and Maggie, and then seeing Leah Shaw and Pope have this kind of weird, like, is this how it's supposed to be? I had a son. I had a sister, or I had a nephew or son, whatever. I don't, I listen, the found family thing with her is just a little off the map, but like, still, I get it. I get it though. You know, like she felt like she had family outside of her family. <laughs> Like, Daryl was outside of her family. Yeah. And so to come back to this, where it's like, really, we're closing the doors on the outside world. What are we if not also kind of like weird, the weird walking dead? Like, if all we do is kill and eat, what are we? Yeah. What do we resemble? Daryl's. Yeah. That's a good parallel. Before we totally switch over to... Pope, Leah, and Daryl conversation. I would like Sharon D to share with us her Maggie theory. Maggie is very much being alpha right now. She's wearing the skin mask, leading a herd towards her enemies, even though somebody she cares about is with that enemy. Alpha Darryl, was leading right. her herd, even though Lydia was there, Lydia. and Maggie is leading this herd, even though Daryl is there. So I definitely see a big parallel with Maggie and Alpha. And that mm. just leads a little more credence to the Maggie Negan thing. <laughs> yeah. Now we're all wondering if they both have black socks on. <laughs> Wait, can you can you drill down on that a little bit just to kind of just to kind of make things clear for people who didn't listen to that episode? The lending credence to the oh, whole yes. hate bangs, essentially. Well, because um, Negan and Alpha. I mean, because because <clears throat> they Negan and Alpha did it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and therefore Negan and Maggie, we have to spell it out. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I have to push you to say the unmentionable things. I don't things. know if there's a, uh, I don't know if there's a latrine dug anywhere near them right now, but. 
Maggie's going to have to shave her head before yeah. anything, before any freaky yeah. deaky happens. <laughs> well, I, you know, what's funny about everything that you're saying. It felt like all the, the whisper masks that Negan made or whatever, it, how, whatever it was, <laughs> they all kind of looked like Alpha's mask too, a little, didn't it kind of? Uh, they all had very similar markings on the no on the bridge of the nose. And I didn't know if that was on purpose or not, but I just kept staring at these gouges that were very similar from one mask to the next. Right. Except for the, the initial untightened mask that Ma- Maggie was wearing, yeah. which I want to <laughs> note because it's just the stupidest Easter egg in the world. That mask looked a lot like the Miles mask that, that had recently been made from Miles and Hildy, that little tiny storyline in oh. the calm before. Do you remember that? I like, do remember that. He, he had the loose mouth and the loose eyes because he had just been made and the guy barely had time to put it on. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I probably am, but didn't Miles have facial hair? Yeah. Didn't he have a... Okay. And my theory on that is that it just kind of fell out. Okay. Because also the hair on top of the head also thinned out too. So it's kind of like, "Eh, nobody's nobody's nerfing, right? Yeah. But now it could be that they just reused it and, you know, just reutilized it because it looked almost exactly the same. And the problem with the Miles mask is that it looked like someone's face exactly because the guy, Miles was recently It's good though. And it's a face we know. Yeah. Yeah. Miles is recently dead. So maybe this is the version of the Miles mask that, you know, given time, gross. (laughs) It's clear by the end of the episode that they are heading towards where the Reaper settlement is, right? I had thought Mm. at first, because I was a little confused as to where Gabe was scouting in this episode. I thought it might have been Meridian at first, because, okay, why take Meridian if not to recapture it, let's say? Mm -hmm. But am I wrong? Or is that where the, is that where they are? I I don't know. I I think that's where Gabe went. I, that was my assumption as well, because he saw the clergyman come out to the graveyard where some, you know, people were buried. It looked like the same place, I thought. Now, is that place Meridian Mm -hmm. or... I believe so. Okay, so where, when they let out all the dead in that one building, mm. where where was that? That's what I yeah. want to know. Because that's all their people. They, they must have, what did they do? What did the Reapers do, rather? Because mm. it sounds Good like question. what they, Yeah, and like, how did they know to go to that place? I don't know that they did so much. I think they just saw the walkers coming through the woods in that direction. So maybe they went that direction and they said, oh, there's, there's this building. And they just went and opened it up and let everybody out. I don't think they actually knew everybody was there. Oh, so you're saying it was just kind of like a random building that they thought may have had more walkers. Well, I mean, I, when they, they ran up to it and they kind of looked in and then they started pulling the, the boards off. So maybe they saw some in there like, oh, let's open it up and let them out. Okay. I don't, and yeah, I, I guess think that was possible just to kind of on their way to Meridian. And okay. since there had been so many walkers in the area that were of her people or their people, uh, hers and Elijah's, I suppose they would have been in that building, which... So we're we're going on the assumption now that the the Reapers have taken over Meridian and that's where they are. So we're clear on that. Okay, good. Fine. That was my mm. assumption. Yeah. All right. That's why yeah. I was a little yeah. confused because it seemed like the building was Meridian or something. Well, I mean, did you did you notice know. that mm. when um, Daryl was in there talking to that guy, he was looking into the food storage and he was scoping out all the food that was in the storage, which is, I guess, the food that Maggie had and them had left behind when about. they had to leave Meridian. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, 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 right. Mm-hmm. And so that, and y- you'll note that that same guy that he speaks to and gives the smokes to, that guy is then seen, and this is interesting, he's then seen uh, later on when Gabe's scoping out the place in that red pickup truck, hauling mm-hmm. food away, possibly, if we're associating him with the food. I don't know, but then where to? That's an mm-hmm. interesting question. Where is that food going? Where is that guy going? Where Where is he going? Where is there to go to? Well, was this, okay, help me out with timelines here. Gabe, scoped out the place before the two reapers came back and got yelled at by pope right so was it those two guys leaving to go scout the areas that leah recommended Mm, i think oh mm, maybe Uh, i I just don't know the order because i didn't i didn't write my notes in chronological i just kind of did it by by but then they like but but when they got when they got back they walked in they didn't drive in so that's why i was confused i think that was earlier was it that's why yeah that's why i said help help me with was early in that help me with timelines yeah Yeah, take your boy and and look (laughs) okay so so that scene happened before gabe went and before Gabe okay. got there. Yeah, let's okay. assume that. But like, but okay. here's, here's a total other, completely other side of this equation. Gas, car, maybe it runs on ethanol. I don't know, but it sure doesn't sound like it. So that's, <laughs> that's like the first car we've seen on The Walking Dead in a very long time. Mm-hmm. It's the same so it's place just, they're getting the tobacco for Daryl's cigarettes. <laughs> and, and matches to light it with. And matches. <laughs> oh, but that's not strange at all. Do you know why? Because of Fort Connors. He, he found a bunch of cigarettes 
and a bunch of matches and a bunch of MREs and a bunch of knives, apparently. But yeah, so he found a nice little treasure trove of stuff. So I don't know anything about the longevity of matches, but would they <laughs> still strike after 12 years? Actually, yes. I, would they? Okay. I, I found that out. For, I have this, no idea. There's this channel, and I, I, I will find this out and put it in post and put it in the blog. There's this channel okay. of this guy who opens up these old, like, uh, MREs and old canned rations and stuff like that from, like, the U.S. Army and the, hmm. the British military and the British Navy. It's so fast. And then he'll eat some of it, like, and make himself sick in some <laughs> cases. But he's very methodical, very scientific. He's like, okay, that's too old. Like, probably trial and error, too, because he's... It's a very long running channel. I will find it. I will post about it. But like, yes, some of the, the matches will definitely work. In, in some cases, the old matches were designed to actually be struck against like, let's say a wall or like just use minimal friction and it just right. works. You didn't need a, Where, whereas you didn't more need a modern strip. matches are safer. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Modern matches need that strike strip. But my old thought, matches did not. My thought though was- um, <laughs> We're literally playing like with fire. The, not the match itself, but whatever the match was on, be the wood or paper, that yeah. would be what deteriorated, not the actual striking head itself. So I mean, I, my feeling mm -hmm. is like if they've mm -hmm. got a box full of wooden matches after 12 years, I'm not sure how uh, the integrity of, of the wooden strike, the wooden part or the mm -hmm. paper part, mm -hmm. depending. I'm not sure any, either way. But, I mean, they're all like sealed and vacuum sealed in plastic. So who knows? But even those, if a little bit of air has can't come in in the process. Mm -hmm. But then again, these are more modern MREs anyway. So it's quite possible that given that vacuum seam pack for like, let's say 10 years, maybe even 20, let's just throw throw the odds to the wind. Yeah, it's, I, I'll assume that it'll still, it'll still strike. Yeah, as long as it's not exposed to air, I think it will. Like this guy's <laughs> opened like rations from like 100 plus years ago. It's crazy. And it's also gross a little consider, bit. Consider that one less bone to pick. Oh, really? <laughs> was that really a bone? What, that was what one was, of, one of what, them. It was at the matches and the smokes? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just considering the haul that he had in uh, 10C with that. Uh, was it, I think it was fine. No, it was diverged. So that's, that's, and then the subsequent first episode, the heist mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So he probably even got more stuff from that place. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah. And it was bone Probably where he got that little fancy pouch where he keeps his smokes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> If we uh, wanted to back up just a little bit, I'll tell you the first bone I had to pick, which yeah. was with Meg Negan and Maggie. Not anything to do with those two, but when they were... <laughs> don't get mad, Rachel. When they were... When Maggie was herding all the walkers and, like, sticking them in this little pen, and then, and then they were just all, like, wandering around in there. Meanwhile, they're, like, 20 feet away, talking like regular people, just standing there, moving around, and the walkers, like, don't see them, don't hear them. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking that, too. too. I'm like, what is going Come on, on here? Come I, I, on. <laughs> I know Gabe at first was kind of like careful about it, but then, and do you remember when like Elijah was hiding behind a tree when yeah. she was trying to practice? And then, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, like the I, walker you know should have been on the rope. Valid. <sighs> Then, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Valid. Completely valid. I, I, I got you. I got you on that one. What was the yeah. thought process? Come well, on, guys. We couldn't, we couldn't hear. We wouldn't have been able to hear the awesome stuff going on between Maggie and Negan with all the walkers growling in the background. So I guess also, it would have made me feel better if they were farther away and like, it, like attempting to talk quieter because they knew they were right there, you know? But that, I mean, again, it has gotcha. nothing, does not affect the episode or the story whatsoever that's just my own personal beef <laughs> that's and that's the thing like people will bring up stuff like this all the, okay like the worst the worst of it for me was like when people like were complaining about how did they get the how did yumiko and and eugene get those crm uniforms yeah like well we know uh, how obviously we know how oh no but we didn't see them do it like it's not important it's not important it's, to the no. story guys it's not no. it doesn't change the way i feel about how but how first of all how funny it must have been mm -hmm. you know it's probably better in your head than it is seeing it out and it doesn't move the story for but like even this okay you could make a good argument here there's a there is a decent bone to pick here because you're <laughs> seeing it that's the worst yeah. part about it is you're seeing yes it. so but even then you rage are what are like, it doesn't bother me. Like, it doesn't change no. the other shit that A, makes me mad, and B, yeah. and B but yeah. also moves the story forward and is very, very depressing in some cases. I love Maggie saying the thing, the quiet part out loud, though. Why would you say that to me? Why would you say that to me of all people? That scene, actually, upon second watch, hit me very hard the second time around. I'm glad you're bringing this specific thing up, and I, I'm going to look like an idiot here for a second, but I don't care in the name of clarity, because even after the second, third time I watched it, 
I, I know I was supposed to feel something extra right there, but I didn't. What did I miss here? Besides the obvious, I feel like anyone else who was in that lineup hearing that from Negan would feel the same way. Like, why is it Maggie? The reason why it hit me harder the second time around is realizing that in some ways, <laughs> Maggie's hate for Negan is reviving her to know that she has feelings. And so you, okay. see, you see this weird awakening in Maggie that she has a soul and she can afford to have feelings of hate of su or feelings in general. So when I see her reacting to this statement uttered by Negan, I'm seeing her like sort of like, she looks drowsy. She looks like, but, but like, like a robot just gaining sentience. It's like, but why would you say that to me? You don't, you're not supposed to say that to a human. <laughs> and so you <laughs> see like her waking up. It kind of goes back to what she was saying. The woman of six years ago or seven years or whatever the fuck she said <laughs> is the only thing that's keeping you alive. And and so it's what you, literally what you said, Rachel, that got me thinking, oh, it's the feelings. The fact mm. that this is something that anchors me to a feeling which I am not allowed to feel anymore. And so when I saw that scene again, I thought of what you said and I was thinking, she's waking up. I mean, it's this weird symbiotic relationship that they're having right now is that, oh, this is my way back from the land of the dead. This is my Asheron. This is my, this is my psycho. Negan, oddly enough, is the, is the crow, the psychopomp that's bringing me up instead of back to the land of the dead, back to the land of, well, technically the land of the dead, <laughs> but technically the land of the living, emotionally speaking, you know, I'm sure she loves Herschel. I'm sure she expresses her love to Herschel and all that stuff, but she has to be a certain way 24 seven to exist in this world. It's clear from looking at the ferals, from looking at all this, hearing all the stories that she's had to go through. That's why I'm looking at someone and Negan knows this. That's the thing. Negan knows that she, A, she needs a straight shooter and he's loving this a little too much, but B, he knows that this hate is going to wake her up. And yeah, he may get the brunt of that hate, but I think he cares. It's this weird thing where I think he cares. He knows he knows how to read people. We've seen this over and over again. And he's enjoying it. He's like, you know, if this is my last day on earth, <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing what I love, teaching, a gym teacher, whatever, what Angela Kang said at the AMC Plus thing with the inside she's trying to take us out of a job. So what you're saying is when Negan made this harsh statement, Maggie felt hatred and then she was like, oh, I can feel hate, so I I'm feeling again. But I guess... I don't know if she's uh, realizing it too. I think she's just kind of like, but why would you say that? Like, she doesn't know how to react to this thing, but she's coming online because it's like a computer booting up, yeah. emotional computer. Like, I know when she was on the train car, she told that story and she said, you know, I feel nothing when I tell you this. But I think all the while she was still feeling anger and hatred towards Negan, don't you? Or do you think she was feeling nothing or? No, I, th I think her story was to illustrate that this is the way I have had to be at least. You guys were lucky. I had to become the thing which I had to battle. All the crazy shit that whatever that, that whole story with the pregnant mm. limbless ladies, I had to almost become that, which is why I was so like destroyed when I saw Aaron even resembling what he may have had to become in this world. Mm. And that's what really struck me. And then watching, watching Maggie sort of emotionally come online where she goes, but why would you say that to me of all people? Like, because you're dead, bitch. I'm trying to wake you up. <laughs> like that's, I think he's trying to play it to where if I can wake this bitch up and remember what made these people so lucky, why I want to be helpful and committed to this cause. He says this too. He says, I would have killed all of you had I known what this world would become and what the Reapers are doing right now. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, they're doing what I should have done. But he says this because, but I am not that guy. That's not who I am. I want to save people. You know, and you, you guys are the ticket to help me keep me be who I am. And I'm going to give that back to you, Maggie. I'm going to give you what your people tried to give back to me when I was trying to, you know, straighten them out. I'm giving you that gift. I'm giving you the gift of emotion and saving people and not treating the world as if it's, you know, that's the way you have to be, the, the way you've had to be for the last six years. That's what made you lucky. Giving people a chance. That's what made you lucky. Do you know what I mean? Because she says, oh, you were lucky. We were lucky. And he knows that. He knows that the saviors, the hilltop, the kingdom, and all these to a, to a greater extent, but some people did not make it. But whatever. The, <laughs> the idea that there's still people around that are like that, that can survive in this world, is rare. But it's rare because they didn't give up on one another. He's saying, that's how you won. That's how you bested me. I'm giving you this gift, you know, of, of being mad at me. 
so that you don't make the same mistake that the Reapers are making now. That's how you survive. By coming online, Maggie. Come the fuck online. I guess when he told her, you know, I would have killed her. I would have done things differently. I would have killed everybody. I guess what I heard him say is, like, kill all the fucking Reapers. Like, we need to kill them all. <laughs> that's and what that's, we need to do is kill them all. That's the kind of debate that I want to get into because I, I'm stuck between what I just told you and also, like, is he neganing a little bit? Yeah. Like, is, is he encouraging her to, to be more of a killer? That I'm, I'm was not, what I felt. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Encouraging I'm, her I'm, to be alpha? Yeah. 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 I'm, I, I'm not sure either, but I, all I know is what, how or it made Lucille, me feel. Or Lucille, way. yeah. All I know is how, how it made me feel. That and I did feel like he was kind of <laughs> hyping her up a little. Like, yeah, I would have done it different. I'd have killed all my enemies. These right. are our enemies. We need to take them all out. I, I, I mean, that was, yeah, oh, like again, giving her I don't a little know. bit more juice. He's telling her what he would have done, essentially saying, here's what Pope's thinking now, right? Yeah, like, here's, yeah. this is his state of mind now. So if he's thinking this way, we need to be three steps ahead of that and kill them first. Which Pope is basically I I exhibiting in this episode. Like, you're talking about, like, a, a survivor, a wounded, dying mother and, and a kid, and Leah can't handle it anymore. Yeah. And Pope is saying, yeah, kill them all. They're useless. What, what, what are you thinking? What do you think? They're not chosen. <laughs> God's people. Do you think, do you think she would have let them go if one, if she had never met Daryl and two, if he were just not with her on the, for that run? Oh, you're saying, okay. Okay. So had Leah never met Daryl? No, she would have marked them completely. Yeah. Okay. Daryl is giving her humanity back. <laughs> That's kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> But that, that's kind of like the irony of the yin yang situation. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, yeah. It's five and a half inches. Sorry. Anyway, whatever. Oh, it's not that bad. Whatever. Anyway, so it's not, it's not three. I mean, anyway, so <laughs> humanity's five and a half inches. It's not the size. It's how it's you new, use it. It's a, yeah, it's a new tagline. But, um, <laughs> No, it's not. Uh, no, but that's, that's the weird yin-yangness yin of, like, Daryl and, and Leah and Maggie and Negan. They're trying to show each other what it means to be human again. Mm -hmm. Maggie, I'm trying to show you what it means, why you're so lucky. Leah, uh, you're strong on your own. What do you, what do you need this clown for? Yeah, I'd be you grateful for what you did for them. I love, I love the subtle, the subtle little drops, these little nuggets that Daryl's dropping all along the way when he can. He sees the opportunity and he just drops a little nugget of doubt in there to further separate Leah and Pope. And it is working perfectly. I mean, she got right in Pope's face in front of her brothers. I was a little worried for Leah in that moment. I, I thought, was too. I thought Pope was going to make an, not kill her, not kill her, but right. make an example of her, at least smack her or lock her up or something. Well, now this gets me to the, uh, this whole other thing that I didn't think I would bring up, but do you think that that might happen? I mean, we keep talking about like <sighs> Leah being killed by, mm. uh, this is the worst thing, but we talk about uh, Leah being killed by Daryl possibly be to save Connie. And we said that oh, in the last episode. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But like things like that, but, like, um, but then we never thought that like Leah would break, try to break away from Pope and Pope not liking that very much and killing Leah or doing something horrible to her. Mm -hmm. Or even Daryl. Hmm, who knows? I don't know what kind of plot armor well, he has. I, Leah is a very hard character to read. Even after this episode where she shows us a little doubt in Pope's plans, I still can't fully figure her out. Like, I still... She still thinks Pope is... Maybe his overall plan is still the right thing, but maybe she's questioning how he does it now. Yeah, maybe she, maybe he's not doing it hard enough. I'm kidding. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but you know what? I, I think it's very, very clear. It's very clear to me anyway that she's all but broken away from Pope. I mean, yeah, maybe there's a snap of the finger or maybe something will happen that might get her to scurry back up to Pope's leg. But her... N just completely disobeying his order, mm -hmm. even after checking in with him, says everything I need to know about where she's at with him. Now, it, it's all in name only. She's not a reaper. She's a reaper. She also could have seen her son in that in that kid too, the son that she lost before she met Daryl. So that could have been why she decided to let them go. Maybe if it had just been the man, she wouldn't have, but maybe she saw her, herself in a less fortunate place where the mother was, and that's why she couldn't put the mother down. Or maybe even like she saw, like it's like that yin yang again, like where where she was the one to be spared, and yet this mother was not. Mm -hmm. Like she she had lost her son, and her her husband Daryl technically, yeah. <laughs> and she was the only one left. And then she scurried back to Pope, and then so mm -hmm. so seeing the the wounded mother being like, okay, I wish I kind of wish I was her. I kind of wish it was that easy. Were it me and not Matthew? Were it me and not and not Daryl? Let's say or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. 
that scene was almost I almost freaked out at that scene too when Leah held her shotgun up and I'm like really you're gonna make an unnecessary mess when Daryl has a crossbow <laughs> I think she probably even knew that yeah yeah I think she even knew that a little too <laughs> Yeah, and so also when bullets. Daryl took his shot. I'm like, good, because yeah. that shotgun, come on, way louder, way louder. Yeah, huge mess. I mean, if the if the father and son were to come back for some reason, be like, how guys, horrible! Keep it down, find. guys. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Just trying to run away in peace. So many wrong things right in a row. I'm like, really? Shock it! And then yeah, and then Daryl, of course, took the shot. So I'm like, okay, thank you, thank you, Daryl, for making the right choice here. Right. But aside from the technical <laughs> difficulties, so that's basically where we're breaking at. Is that is that Leah is reaching a break? Well, between that incident and her not even acknowledging uh, Pope's order. And, you know, obviously covering it up because that's what we have to do when we lie. Again, we're going back to lies. This is just, this is escalating. This is all spiraling. So let me ask an even simpler question. What do you think of Leah? What do you think of her as a I character? Like yeah, I'm, I like I'm her. really, I'm really, she's really compelling to me. Mm. And I, I'm look. I'm staring at you, Rachel. I'm trying to gauge what is going <laughs> on here. I... Do you not want to like her? I have to put my brain into a very specific <laughs> state. I have to think about Leah and completely forget about Carol if I can decide before I can decide if I like her or not. As mm. a standalone character, I think I like her. She's just as complicated as as all the other characters that we love. She doesn't always know what's right. She is victim of following the wrong person. Mm. <laughs> You know, you said something that that, <laughs> that, that triggered another yin yang thing. Because I'm now I'm seeing it everywhere. Mm. In watching Leah sort of be Reaper in name only and sort of exit their purview, right? I'm seeing Yumiko kind of go in mm. on the Commonwealth, right? Mm -hmm. Yumiko, in seeing her brother and and you know, first of all, outing her brother from the very beginning, which oh. is used by Lance Hornsby as sort of this like, oh, I have this nugget here. Oh, let's mm -hmm. play that card. Boom. Were you trying to get your friends up? Boom. Now nah, I need them, son. So I took your brother. So shut the fuck up. <laughs> so, but okay, putting that aside, isn't it really, really odd that you see Yumiko go right back into her old world life, whereas Leah is kind of trying to walk away, but she keeps getting pulled back in. It's just this weird, like, in through the outdoor sort of thing. It's like, it's like, what's going on here? I see her so comfortable in this role. She's ordering people around. Maybe that's how she was. She was kind of an asshole, it sounds like. <laughs> she was a think? lawyer, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas before, okay, this makes a lot more, okay, okay, okay. Whoa, 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 let's take a step back. This makes a lot more sense when it comes to like early scenes with her and Magna, because there's this w interesting tendency of Magna going, stop thinking you can order people around. You mean, you're mm -hmm. not that lawyer anymore. And now we go to the Commonwealth and we, act we see exactly what unleashed Yumiko is like unleashed, let's say pre-apocalypse. And it's, I like it. Ta it's interesting, but it's dangerous. Tommy even says, still trying to control people's life, Miko? I mean, he even says it flat out. So, yeah. This could have been something yeah. Magna literally said in in season nine, let's say. By the way, back there. Get back there, yeah. but where season nine is. Okay. So, Netflix or something. <laughs> but it does get him into trouble. And this is one of the things we warned about. It's like, oh, oh she used that as a card to expedite their fucking asylum. That was the thing. That was the thing mm -hmm. that... And so that's been on the cards for a long time. And now they're finally pulling that card. They finally arrive outside of Stephanie's office. It's this weird, surreal moment, I think, that Yumiko is starting to have. And you see, like, the camera, the wide shot actually kind of distorts the office a little bit. Yumiko's on the left, you know, bottom left of the screen. Stephanie's, like, in the back. But the wide angle of the camera, the lens distorts Stephanie. So this is weird. Like, is this really happening? Yumiko is thinking, I'm thinking, you know, is this really, is this life? Is, is this pretend? What, what is this? What? And then she opens up the, the table book of this, uh, Bella yeah. Vacanza. Bella Vacanza, which literally means pleasant holiday. Yep. <laughs> You're opening this book of somewhere you will never visit. And if it, you do visit <laughs> for some miracle of a reason, it is dead. It, it's not the way it was. Nothing is the way it was. Right. It's just it, very bizarre. I feel like that's a common thing, even even right now in our, our real lives. Like people buy books of from pl of places that they want to go that maybe they never will. People who want to travel but can't, and so they buy books and look at pictures instead. Like okay. that's that's a thing now. Oh, hope, and, and right, it's giving you hope. And, and what what is it? Was it Angela King says? You know, they they, they were 
attempting to revive a world that maybe was never meant to be revived. That's what Angela King said in the last episode. It, right? And, because this yeah. is what we would do. The 16 different somebodies that, you know, Morgan's had to be versus, you know, oh, maybe somebody changed like once or a cup, couple times in their lives, but Morgan's been 16 different somebodies. Yeah. But that kind of is emblematic of what's going on here. It's like, okay, you are bullshitting yourself through life again? Ooh. And it's yeah. even a, a harsher reality. Like, talk about like throwing it in your face. Not only did you not go pre-apocalypse you're not there is no way you're going now there is a little weird uneasiness in yumiko's face now all of that is interrupted by stephanie's phone call right but mm-hmm. but you do get this really weird sense that like she gets it she's like this is like it's trying to break in between her and her interaction with tommy was like you're you're still you still want to be that old person did you forget like the sort of leader pseudo leader of hilltop you were at some point like i mean he doesn't know this but like, what happened yeah. to that bow-wielding, uh, you know, badass from the comic books? I mean, from, from the, our story. But she all but forgot it. And maybe this is also similar to what the comic books were, too. Like, th- was there that little bit of Michonne that kind of forgot the killer she was? Can you- uh, I, I don't, I can't say if she forgot or, or who like, she was, but, snap but back. When, she, when she entered the Commonwealth, she went, like, full into lawyer mode. I mean, changed her attire, her hair changed, everything about her changed. Yes. Wow. Now, wow. was she still capable? Of oh, course. Yeah, I'm sure. She still had the skills, but you don't see them as much. Right. And you know what's funny is that you, you now that it's a TV show, you can see the struggle. You can see the little minute micro mm-hmm. micro realizations and then like, oh, snap back into like, oh, I'm lawyer again. Mm-hmm. Like oh, You get to see that in close. You can't see that in a panel so much. But, yeah. but what is the bone you have to pick with that particular scene? Is that? Yeah. Yes. That particular scene, the book that Miko's holding, when she opens it, you can very clearly see the little tab that she's supposed to grab onto to flip open to the right page and if you'll notice she's on page 118 and 119 and then when she turns the page it goes to 122 123 so what happened to 120 and 121 i mean is that the bone <laughs> the page yeah the pages were stuck together they could have like whited out the numbers maybe there's nudity on that page Ayo! okay Oh, we're not going here? Okay. All right. Just me. I'll have a party by myself. Thank you, everybody. Good night. (laughs) I told you. I told you. All my bones are so stupid, and they don't affect the story whatsoever. They're just nitpicky things that I noticed, and I'm like, It almost goes to what I'm saying, though, in a weird way, because, like, it's, okay, this book has obviously survived the apocalypse, and it's not even, I don't know, maybe it's not even, it was those, the page was torn out. Like, what are you doing? No, they're clearly stuck together. Uh, like, okay. that pi- that page was, like, two and a half inches thick. <laughs> no, it was... This is corrugated plastic. What? No, they, like, somebody, like, glued those two pages together. It was probably... That's what I'm saying. It was, it, well, it went from picture, <laughs> like, she was looking at pictures, and then she turned the pictures, and then the in-between pages were probably just words and didn't have any pictures on them, and they're like, these aren't important, so we're going to stick them together and just what go good from picture to picture. Yeah. But, yeah. but, and, and it but I to, noticed because the page numbers skipped. <laughs> but it, it goes to show that, that that the Commonwealth is built around this premise that like, okay, we are trying to lull you to sleep. And I had an, another thought about this, but and I will go back to Stephanie because I need to. But I had oh, another oh, oh. thought about this that really like woke me up. That we really didn't concentrate on it as much, but we didn't have the, the, the insight that we have now being a couple episodes in, right? Yumiko and... And Eugene and the king and princess were all at the reprocessing center, right? But we didn't know how bad things were out there, right? And I'm thinking about the Commonwealth is built around this premise that you are who you were before, but we have to get you there first. We talked about what what it must have been like to get the first few survivors and fuck up. They hold a gun to Pamela Milton's head and then you have to blow them away. It's like, ah, let's try this reprocessing thing again. <laughs> but like the whole idea, and now I'm thinking back to the guy guess, that, that said, oh, we've only been here four months. Honey, it's been nine. What? Pandemic? Anyway, so like the whole idea being that we have to kind of break them down again. We kind of have to get them used to a slower life. Like, kind of like, like what Tom... Mm. Yeah, but like in reverse. Instead mm-hmm. of like making you like more capable fighters and more like, you know, you're ready out for the wilderness training. No, we're kind of turning you into... Demilitarizing dough- them. Yeah, we're, we're making you into <laughs> doughy pieces of crap so that you can be doughy... You can have little desk jobs and, and you can make deep. If we deep. were if we were at the Commonwealth, we'd be podcasters. We'd be at the radio yeah. broadcast. Oh, no. We'd be out there killing the walkers like... <laughs> Um, Ezekiel and Princess and <laughs> Fakeny and Eugene. Honestly, I, I like toilet yeah. paper too much, guys. I, I'm I sorry. Also, I'll take I'll take um, the podcast job. Thank you. <laughs> I, I told Rachel that Stephanie, if since this is a 
uh, trick or whatever. She is seriously deep into this. Like, she's in there killing walkers and stuff. Like, it, oh, faking it, is she, right. Is she, yeah. like, a, a CIA operative type who's, like, totally into going undercover and she's totally, like, secretly got all these badass skills. She could just be in there killing walkers and not be... Because there's no safety net there for her. Like, right. there, there, she could she die. Is, you know what? Okay, you said something very interesting. Well, let, let me let me close out the book on this reprocessing thing. But you get the idea, though, that, that, that we have to re-educate... We have to turn them into doughy messes from the yeah. trauma that must have been the outside world. Okay, but going back to Stephanie, or Fakeny, whatever we're going to call her, she, it sounds like... Because she says in this thing yeah it's really only the military that disposes of walkers this goes back to the conversation that we were saying before about about class systems and who gets to fight the dead and save the living or whatever join the commonwealth you know the little advertisement that's in the train station that you get to hear over okay that's the commonwealth way right she was military (laughs) for sure because she knows how to kill walkers fucking pipsqueak what's his fuck Uh, i I call by the way i call him baby milton i just cannot call him because we don't know his name i know you know his name it's sebastian whatever but we i don't know his name yet i'm being ignorant baby milton they haven't said it yet so it almost makes me wonder if they're gonna change it right like maybe maybe they won't call him sebastian Oh God, he plays okay. he plays it way better than I've, the the panels that I've seen. Like, and I've only seen like one or two. But like, he's just so much more like like boat shoes and he's pastel horrible. Colors. It's horrible, great. isn't it? He awesome. Is, he is such a terrible character. You're, everyone's gonna love to hate him. So I'm I'm wondering since I know what happens, what he does in the comic books, right? Can I, I say that here? I can I, say I, it? I don't, but you can you can go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, it's fine. So he he kills Rick in the comic books, right? Sebastian. Oh, was, yes. Okay. Oh, so I my question about is, that. okay, okay, who if 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 they carry on the comic book story, who is going to be the Rick? Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, we keep you and saying, I talked about this. Yes, we talked about this. We, we did. Were like, who who is our Rick now? We don't have a leader in, in Alexandria. So who is going to be the Rick if they carry on that that storyline? So I had a thought about this. I might even sort of back off my position about Ezekiel taking on that role of the Dwight role a little bit, o- only because I feel like maybe Eugene might take that over. I'm starting to feel things here that like we're putting Eugene in a certain position that I don't know that he was in in the comic books. If I'm not mistaken, he was at the Commonwealth, but not killing, not doing this, not doing he, this kind of hard labor. And he was absolutely way more of a badass. Uh, Eugene in the comic books it seems like I think uh, I think our screen Eugene has risen to the level of comic book Eugene or or at least is because what I noticed in the first watch at least I was like yeah I feel like they're kind of finally meeting all the way finally like near the end of the comic book land is like oh now that he's finally realizing himself because I'm seeing a rough Eugene like that is has been through like it just looks like he's he's tried so hard to kind of make it into the good graces and he keeps doing things wrong and I feel like he might end up being that comic book Eugene at some point like being a badass and being capable and being stronger and more forceful and charismatic see I I thought I saw a lot of that when he ran over to save Sebastian well yeah 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 but that's that's what got me to start thinking of it and then like seeing him in jail it just kind of solidified it too yeah I'm sorry I should have made that clear okay 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 but I feel like yeah like oh yeah that's when I first saw it and then like I'm like he's in the jail he looks more rough looks more looks more grizzled he he didn't look (laughs) Okay, this is what I mostly noticed about him sitting in the cell is he didn't look nearly as terrified. He didn't look he he looked worried, but not terrified like he was in the interrogation room. Right. What a difference. I, he what was a holding difference. his own. Yeah. Yeah. So I had another thought about Eugene which I've talked to Rachel about. What if he's playing in the long con? What if he knows what's going on? He knows that they're tricking him. He knows that's not Stephanie and he's playing the long con to find out what the hell they're up to. Right. We did talk before. a lot about this. He played the long con with Abraham. He played the con with Negan. Yep. With Negan yep. and the bullets. So what if Eugene, like the whole thing with the ice cream, when he asked her if it was Rocky Road and she didn't answer, I think maybe he knows that Stephanie is not Stephanie. Ugh, I'm so and annoyed. he's playing the <laughs> long con. Especially since yeah. they played the, the Sting the Sting music, the entertainer from the Sting. They yeah. played that over his scene. We all thought it was referring to Stephanie's. What if it was referring to Eugene? Right, I got cons on cons I, on cons. I agreed with Sharon D when we talked about this too, because the more I think about it, the the one thing that I keep going back to is her voice. Eugene talked to her for months. If all you have is a voice, you are going to memorize every pitch and tone and inflection and everything about that voice. Don't, I, I, and Eugene is smart. He's a smart guy. 
I gotta believe mm -hmm. that he knows he's not talking to the same person. Yeah, the only thing that I'm feeling is is ringing true and out of all this is that he knows that Stephanie is not the Stephanie that he is betrothed. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I know. As far as like the the going a little bit further, like conception, <laughs> mm -hmm. I I don't know. I don't know. Well, but we could say he's conning her just just in the fact that he's not saying, "Hey, I know what I you're know who to. you he's, are." Right. He's right. going along. He's going along with it. However, something, Sharon, something you said got me to think, oh, shit, because of that Rocky <laughs> Road comment. And she goes, I yeah. got ice cream, bitch. Bye. I got to go to Pamela Milton. We haven't heard all of Tater Bug and, and Blue Evil's conversations on the radio. Right. What if they had discussed this way ahead of time? Like, it's not great here. She's not telling them where they are, but she is divulging, like, the, the type of society that they have. Not names, not specifics, but like, yeah, maybe he knows everything about what's going on. And so they have a sort of understanding. Maybe he knows a lot more about the Commonwealth that than we do, first of all. Mm -hmm. And then when he sees Steph Stephanie Vega, the real one, by the way, that's her name. Yeah. For yeah. You you guys know, but I'm telling the audience. <laughs> um, then he, he knows it's her. And he has to kind of play the long con. This is what pissed me off. I'm like, oh, it's one of those things where it's like it's like Ocean's Eleven when they pull off the heist and then they rewind and show us how it was done. Uh -huh. That they're gonna show us a scene with or a conversation with Stephanie, like first yeah. of all, it take which takes us back like either to the beginning of yeah, probably the beginning of season ten. <laughs> like, you know, oh, hey, I love you, burr, 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 da, 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 and they tell you about the Commonwealth and <laughs> whatever. Burr, love you, Tater Bark, love you, Blue Evil. And they, by the way, and I, I'm using the same voice for both because when we finally see Stephanie kind of talk, <laughs> she does kind of sound like Eugene. Fastidious. I mean, like uh -huh. using, right? Like, okay, all right. The big vocabulary, yeah. Right. But then also like just that kind of like almost like the the switched offness of old Eugene a little bit. I mean, Eugene now kind of talks like that too, sort of still. But the general kind of like, yeah, I'm a robot. Yeah, sure, what? So, <laughs> but not with the redneck voice. But it, and then the glasses and the, you know whatever. But <laughs> wait, but we have to talk a little bit about Stephanie a little bit more because when she's having this kind of small talk conversation about Yumiko, she's well aware of who she is, oh, what her yeah. crew is. Mm -hmm. What it seems like she didn't know was that... Yumiko had mentioned she hadn't seen her friends in a few days and that they were out clearing something. Right. And Stephanie said, is everyone okay? Right. And she made a face, first of all. There was like a little, like a yeah. like a, a, a tiny twinge of a pained face. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying mm -hmm. that, by the way. And then, and then she kind of, is everybody okay? Because she wants to know if her baby's okay. Yeah. Oh. She, what she meant to say was, on this is, one? is Eugene okay? <laughs> right. Yeah. She can't do, yeah. she can't do that. Is my tater bug no. okay? Yeah. How's my tater bug? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I think we all heard that. <laughs> okay, good. Because, you know, if you don't really watch, you, you're not going to see that. And she, there's another, she has it that same sort of pseudo pained face again when she gets mm -hmm. the phone call and relays this news to Yumiko. Because she yeah. knows her baby's in jail. <laughs> yeah. Some, she says, someone attacked Pamela's uh, so son. Pamela's son, right, exactly. <laughs> My baby's in trouble. <laughs> This plan is going a little too far that I have secretly with Eugene. <laughs> yeah. I want to say this is all Lance's doing. This is Lance's orchestrating. I, I wonder how much control or say, if any, Stephanie has in any of this. Obviously, she's aware of what's going on, but Lance might just be like, sit down and shut up. I'll let you know when you can talk to him. How did Stephanie even get to the radio to talk to Eugene? Like, if, if it's that closed off everywhere, how does she even... Well, the, the fakeny tells us that she worked in that department, right? Didn't she? Oh, when I mean, they're sitting down know. and eating well, ice cream? Before, least, yeah, when they're eating ice cream. The real, Stephanie eating, the real Stephanie obviously works for Pamela right. Milton. So, so maybe how did real Stephanie... Maybe fakeny is actually the secretary and Stephanie actually worked in the radio room and they wow. switched for the con. They're really, really putting some shit into this con. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be the easiest way to do it, right? I mean, if, if this person is already a secretary and she's going to go pretend to be someone else, well, then the real person would come fill her spot. Maybe Fakeny okay. was originally Pam's secretary. Mm -hmm. That was her job before our group came to the Commonwealth. Okay, mm -hmm. we show up. Lance comes up with this plan to psych out Eugene and says, okay, you're going to pretend to be Stephanie so that we can find out, so we can really find out if we can trust these people. So mm -hmm. you're going to go play this part. Okay, now Pamela doesn't have a secretary. So we're, so now we take the real Stephanie and, and she we fills put in her, for her here to do the job. Oh, yeah. so you're, okay, you're saying this, okay. 
Wow. She needs an actual. So Pamela needs a secretary. So you're saying in this, this scenario, in this scenario, <laughs> real Stephanie is in cahoots with Lance. Well, she knows what's going on. Sure, I think that's obvious, right? She she has to know that Eugene's being conned. She saw him with Fakeny at the ice cream truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that that and they, so this is the conception thing at work here because there it could be anything. It could. That's, that's it, the it, thing it, that yeah. bugs me. Pamela Milton may not even notice <laughs> that the two se- Stephanie <laughs> switch, which is kind of like what. But like, but okay. then you were but then okay. you were proposing it, and I was just kind of like, but but she, she can't be that stupid. But here's why I say that she can be that stupid because. <laughs> <laughs> because I suddenly had this flash to the hilltop. And what was the hilltop formula? Okay, Gregory is quote unquote Ugh. in charge, but mm-hmm. who was really in charge? The second in command, Jesus at that time. Right. The only person who seemed to sort of really be in charge and really be in charge was when Maggie was running hilltop uh, and Jesus was just underneath her, right? And even then Enid was kind of running the show, wasn't she? Or Tara, I'm sorry, not Enid, Tara. Oh, that was at... Tara, oh, well, Tara that was, was that was when Jesus was in charge. Then yeah. the hilltop formula returned, <laughs> where Jesus was in charge, but was kind of putting his feet up. Ah, okay. whatever, I'll do nothing. Then it was today. Enid with Meg. Yeah. Either way, I, 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 I the formula's there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the consistent hilltop formula where hilltop does better than ever is <laughs> when yeah. there's a yeah second yeah. in command who's really in charge. But then I thought, yeah. but wouldn't it be interesting if if Stephanie was really in charge and Pamela was just kind of like a dummy? Which it seems mm. it could be leaning in that direction because for all the shadiness that Lance Hornsby is trying to do, all the stupidity that Baby Milton is, all the cons on cons on cons that both Fakeny and Stephanie are clearly, I don't, not clearly, but seeming to be moving in the background, mm-hmm. it would make perfect sense for the for the leader of this grand community to be an absolute fuck dummy. And that these are just really like paper tigers, like Baby Milton, Pamela, they're useful idiots. It's really the people that are in charge, but we, we just pretend, it's like the king and queen of England, right? Or like, oh, sorry, it's like the Queen of like England. British monarchy. Yeah, it's like, oh, this is, this yeah. is, you know, they're not really in charge. It's just, you know, we just, it's like a glass museum. It's like, it's like a Twilight Zone episode, right? <laughs> they're behind a cage where you can see, oh, hey guys, hi. We feed them three times a day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's essentially what it is. However, in this scenario, it seems to be that if you punch the paper tiger, it punches back. <laughs> so Eugene's in jail and, but. Oh. I love when you said, first of all, that you hated the Sebastian of the comics. And then this Sebastian, I'm looking at him scream and Michael, first of all, now I have to break it. I have to say Michael James Shaw's face. And I'm like saying, (laughs) can you imagine the conversation he had to have before? And he said, like, listen, I'm going to be super awful to you, right? (laughs) This is how (laughs) it's going to go Please don't hurt me. (laughs) No, and it's not that please don't hurt me. Like just, but I I remember like I've seen interviews where like sometimes with kids, when you, when you say, okay, listen, I got to prepare you. Like I'm Mm going to be doing this, this and that. You're not going to see it coming. It's going to be, but I don't try not to get affected by this. It's, it's just me acting. I, I adore you. I respect you. It's like, then, and then you go into the scene and like, and then the actor's just like, I don't remember the guy's name even, but he's just like yelling at, at Mercer's face like, you! And then hits his Sherbert armor Poking really him. hard. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Poor Mr. Sherbert. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I love more than anything when it comes to acting is I love it when they commit. I love it when they commit. Like when they just go full force because then I can hate them a little bit. But then I, but then I, I see the acting and then I, I love them. I'm like, thank you for being this awful dickwad. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? yeah. But so it's hard for me to hate. Like, a, it's hard for me to hate a character when I love the acting. It's like, I have this weird relationship with this show. It's like, do you, do you know well, what I mean? Well, you hate, you hate the character, you love the actor. Yeah. Like, e- even, how, mu- how long yeah. have we been spouting this? Yeah. I, I know, but like, it's tur- it's morphing. It's turning into something gross. Uh-oh. Like, oh, please be more awful. Like, you know what I mean? Like, please be more awful to, to our heroes. Let's oh, see. just oh. you wait. You want more <laughs> awfulness? It's coming. Ugh. Well, we, we don't know, Baby Milton. What, what if somebody kills him, like, in the onset? Oh, that certainly changed in the comics, didn't it? Yeah, if they kill him off right away, that's that'll be, um, it'll we'll be, be very surprising. And we'll be off the reservation. Tons of missed opportunity for a very colorful character to have some pretty crazy moments on screen. I mean, he's not like anything we've seen. This is someone, mm, I mean, right? imagine, imagine if all the Alexandrians just continued to live in safety. I mean, this That's kid's it. never, he's never had to do anything for himself. You ruined my date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I highlight that with the fact that what I was trying to say before about the kids, like the kids had the exact opposite problem. They were playing too much with danger because mm-hmm. they thought they were capable of this post apocalypse This is how awful I things are. I can do are. this. Yeah, yeah. But then you can't, <laughs> oh, God. 
Oh my no. God. You're watching no. this in real time and it's just, it's just a car crash. <laughs> no, Baby Milton thinks he is safe simply because he is who he is. He thinks his name keeps him safe. He's like the Karen, like he's like yelling at the walkers. Don't you know yeah. who I am? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. He, he clearly doesn't away. listen to our podcast. Otherwise he would know that walkers don't care if you're cocky. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Carl, sorry. <laughs> so, I'm really sorry. I, I don't mean that. Oh, God. Carl wasn't cocky. No, but well, you, they are all cocky if they think they can live. They're not going if they, to. <laughs> if people forget how dangerous the walkers are, yeah, that's that's a little cocky. Before we move on, I had another bone oh, please. right there during that scene. Okay, Is it five well, and a half inches? What? Okay. No, no, no. It's just so stupid. And and while More I was than watching my comment? it. Even, no, no, no. Even while I was watching it today with Eric, he said the same thing I did the first time I watched it. So Eugene's, Eugene and, and Baby Milton are there bitching at each other, and this walker's coming over, and Fake, and he's going, um, um, Eugene, <laughs> um, Eugene? um, excuse, excuse me. me, um, um, uh, 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 and I'm like, shut the fuck up, bitch, go kill it yourself! <laughs> Go, I just, what the hell's happening? I just I just liked it for the com- comedic factor alone. <laughs> this I, I I enjoy and now now I can watch it a third time because I only watch it twice and I can see I can hear your voice in the back of my head. <laughs> Bitch, go go like, go! That makes it so much more enjoyable to me. Well, I think a she was trying to get Eugene to stop arguing with with baby Milton. Oh okay. yeah, that's and the other. B, right. she was Thank trying you for to let him. She was trying to let him continue to be a hero because that was the plan. Even I mean, she must have known what's going on because Hornsby was like, "I want you to take him up there and clear the brush up here." And she's like, "Oh yeah, I know where that is." Yeah. So um, she was trying to get Eugene to stop arguing with Baby Milton and to go kill the Walker and be the hero. Thank you for that, first of all, because you just rescued us from a just like just we would never have answered that question satisfactorily. Nope. For I was just gu- I was just going to be mad that she was standing there going, "Um, excuse me, um, excuse me." And, and me and I'm going to be happy because I just I'm enjoying this comedic <laughs> factor. So, and somewhere in between, the truth lies in that I left. I laughed a little bit at first, and then the longer she stood there, I'm like, just go. He's but, just go. <laughs> but you know, stack these two moments together. The absurdity of him not realizing the danger of walkers, but then also the absurdity of, of what you're describing. Like, you're stacking two yin-yangy absurd things together, and you have this smushy little yin-yang sandwich. Did you guys think that Lance unleashed these walkers on yes uh, milton okay th- i thought the same thing i thought the yeah. same thing okay it just goes to show how much of an idiot he really is because hornsby yeah like he doesn't okay. really know that nothing you can do because he all he's concerned with all he really wants it seems that we and let's all agree on this let's see maybe we don't all is he just wants somebody that has pull <laughs> he just yeah. wants somebody at the top because he obviously can't be for some reason i don't know what he became post-apocalyptic but it, clearly he is some sort of pr guy in the commonwealth of some kind like either marketing or like i'm just a tv personality but he, he was has, probably a podcaster he, he pff, baby <laughs> whoa god poor guy but he became something more in the apocalypse and then when he came i don't I, i'm making assumptions but then he came back to the uh, to the Commonwealth. They put him as this little mouthpiece guy. But he has these aspirations. He has these le- leadership aspirations. He has these Spencer aspirations, right? But he can't get there without some sort of conduit, a hero in Eugene or putting Yumiko as a lawyer or whatever. He needs somebody to pull him up or something like that. But he clearly doesn't know people well enough to know the plan he was proposing for Eugene would have never worked. Even if Eugene had done everything right, fucking baby Milton was still mad. You brought him- we have guards for that, you fucking plebe. You're plebeian, mm-hmm. he says. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. And then he calls he calls them something else, the nasties. He wasn't referring to the walkers. He was referring right. to the people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which yep. illustrates the clear, weird, fuck class divide that they have right now, which I love. I just love that he said it that way. Oh, I love to, I love to hate him, but I also love to love his acting. Woo. <laughs> How old do you think Baby Milton is? Oh, I think he's definitely early twenties. I was gonna say definitely older than thirty, which is odd. Yeah, I mean, he, oh wow, he, I would say early to mid twenties. Oh, I was wow. thinking no, I was thinking like twenty three, twenty four. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at the actors, but you could be right. I'm looking at the actor. I'm saying he's definitely thirty plus, but maybe he's playing somebody in his mid twenties. Okay, fine. Because See, I I'm thought th- he looked very young too, though. But what what was interesting to me is that okay, what we what we often have to because this is something I said to Lisa la- last week was the the ferals looked awfully young to me. And if that's the case, and we went through a 10 year time jump or 12 year even time jump from the time the fall happened, well, these people were like barely teenagers, well, right? When you so say th- young. Well, they looked kind of you- like in their mid twenties, right? Like the ferals. 
Okay. So then, I, what were they when they started? Yeah. You know, like I teenagers. I didn't really get a good good enough look at any of their faces, except the 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 girl one that was posted online. Like, right. That was like it, a post she looked picture. fairly young, right? She did. Yeah, she yeah. looked pretty young. And and even like I got a I got a few close ups of some of the ones that were flailing around with the zombies at the end. Okay. And okay. they looked the guy looked fairly young. And so like okay. my as my so I'm trying to what I'm trying to say by taking that like first of all that's very sad and there's a whole tale to be told there. But to, going back to, to Baby Milton, I'm not calling him by his name. He's a time capsule. I mean, he's literally a time capsule. Like he got to be whatever he wanted to be early on, and he just stayed that way. He didn't age out, didn't get look grosser, didn't look any. This is why I say he's in his thirties because it, maybe because that's that's the way he stayed. He got to stay. He got to enter in as a board shorts wearing, or I don't know, board shorts, khaki shorts wearing, <laughs> boat shoes wearing motherfucker, yeah. <laughs> and then he got to stay that sweater. Way. Yeah, right. yeah. Of, draped over his shoulders and tied together. That, that could be he. He could be older than we think, but because he's behaving like an immature child, yeah. he's giving off the mm. that younger feeling. Well, because he can. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, he's a spoiled rotten brat. Yeah, and he got to stay that way. I don't know. Whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just, it doesn't really matter. But like, I, and I'm fine if he's like even 18. I don't. I don't really care. Yeah, I, it doesn't matter. I just was. But curious. I just. It's just funner. To, to maybe even think, oh my God, this guy's 34? Yeah. You're like that, I, you're like, oh, it's it's disturbing is what it is. That's that's what really bugs me. It's, it's a little disturbing to the think man about. child. Yeah, exactly. But like, and how appropriate would that be for this day and age too? Like just how many people make it? I mean, I, I used to hear about so many stories about like people like double my age, but acting more childish than me. Like Pete, like men in their forties and fifties and sixties, but like never grew up. And like here I am at twenty. Like, do I stand a chance? <laughs> well, no. But what I mean is like being completely irresponsible, like, like not taking care of themselves. <laughs> but, you know, no, no. You bathe. <laughs> you bathe. <laughs> so I hear. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Dennis can confirm. Anyway, so. But but like just and like not not you know more than Daryl anyway. Middle fingers to their family and their girlfriends and the people that are, that are they're supposed to love. And but so then when I think about like how interesting it would be for Baby Milton to be like some sort of mid thirties man child kind of like stayed the same entering into the apo- I think it's kind of apropos, you know. It's 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 just emblematic of what this community is. Meanwhile, everything is accelerated in the apocalypse. This asshole got to stay the same. So I, I just, you, you gotta, I, we're playing with themes here that are very interesting here. I don't know. I'm hoping, but you know, I'm, I'm okay if he's like, I don't know, 16. What? <laughs> he's not 16. <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to go back to Gabe's moment because he, he basically goes to scout the Reaper camp, it sounds like. It sounds like where the Reapers live. I'm not sure, 100%. <laughs> Again, I think so. Yeah, I think... I, I'm gonna go with you guys. Whatever you guys say, I'm going with because I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. But and that is Meridian, right? I, that that was that my was conclusion. My right. Mm-hmm. He's near a graveyard where this one Reaper is kind of I don't know paying respects but praying. But he's the Reaper is saying the same prayer that Gabe just said had just said earlier, burying Ter- Teresa. Right. Teresa. Um, Elijah's sister's friend. Sister's right? best friend. Same yeah. exact prayer. I thought that was so spooky, and I think Gabe thought it was a bit spooky too. You know, because I mean, like I so said, there's a lot of prayers you could, like just oh, crack open a book, and here's a prayer for the dead. Well, and, he was walking through a graveyard though, so it'd be a fitting prayer to say, right? Well, but what what is the one prayer we tend to use when what we, we like let's say in TVs and movies? Because whatever, it's the um, yay through I, though I walk through the valley through the shadow, of the shadow of death, death, I shall feel no evil. The rod the and my staff come. Yeah, 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 right. But Gabe, cho- but not Gabe, a clergyman. And even Gabe, they wouldn't choose. Maybe, but but to be so specific with that specific prayer now, and that specific prayer, when I looked it up, is is literally uh, to spare the righteous from the evil that will come. Mm. Yeah, right. Isn't that crazy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we talk about yin, yins and Fitting. yangs, and we talk about being on the other side of where you are now. I am of you, but I am not you. And note, like that, when he goes back to Maggie, he says, "I." I didn't what, what, like that. I didn't see anybody, or that nobody saw me. Yeah. Well, she asked, it, "Did you run into anybody?" And he goes, "Nope." nope. And then tucks tail and runs. <laughs> right. Right. He goes, "Nope." <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> and and yet, and we're talking. And then we have to go back to lies, right? And, mm-hmm. and but and then you wonder, did he see him? Did he not see him? The the oh, Reaper. I think he saw Reaper, him. the Reaper preacher is what I'm going to call him. All right, I gotta. But there was something I, so spooky and so. It was stirring. definitely spooky. Like, did was, you get the feeling that the that the Father Reaper saw the, Gabe? The, the Reaper preacher? A, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That he saw Gabe for a second? I, I don't know. I can't say, I but I can did. say that it's spooky. 
<laughs> yeah. I, I got the impression that he, if he didn't see him, he at least knew he was being watched. Father. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the double and entendre. He, yeah. And he says, thank you, Father, Thank before you, Father. He leaves. Looking right where Gabe was just standing. Mm-hmm. Or, or generally in the direction. Right. <laughs> right. So, That's the vagueness Was he talking to Gabe? Was he talking to, the, to God? Was he, I where, he yeah. I really mm-hmm. look right at Gabe. Once he saw Gabe, he could be like, oh, I didn't see him and go off and, and then trail him because mm. Gabe left and went back. So he could have followed them or Ooh, yeah. said, hey, I saw him here and this is where they went. So go this way. Mm-hmm. It was making me think Gabe probably should have killed him. Going along with what Dave was saying earlier about Negan saying I should have killed everybody. Gabe probably should have killed that guy. Yeah, that might might end up coming back to bite him in the ass. Yeah. Or not doing something about it. Granted, this isn't the first Reaper that Gabe has come across, but it's one of the first, and it ha- just happens to be a man of God. Gabe happens to be struggling with his faith right now. Well, it's the second man of God, because the first one, he just out, just out, just... just well, no, this is an actual, him. this is an actual man of God, not... Right, right, not, right, right. Well, not do, a do follower. You, right. Do you, do you, so, because right. given what he says to Maggie... Do you feel like in that moment, him saying the same prayer, the same exact prayer that he did, the Reaper Preacher, as Gabe did, do you think something is happening here that that he may have gotten spooked a bit or maybe something hit him really hard? Because I say this because I was perusing Reddit and I came Ugh, upon a thread. Why? Well, no, I came upon a thread that was very interesting because it discussed, uh, it was actually overlaying Rick's words with some of the villains that were on this. Really, typically, we, we do quotes, but they are technically the villains of the show. So like, you'll have a Shane quote and then Rick will have said the same thing seasons later. Um, the governor, seasons okay. later. And then even, I think... Um, there was one more, but I can't remember. That's not the important one. The important one is the the governor, because I often refer to this, to, to, we have to kill them all. The governor says we have to kill them all. Mm-hmm. He Rick says this in the church in six, in season six, let's just say that. Uh, Morgan protests. And during the back and forth, and it was respectful dialogue, right? But during the back and forth, you see Tara, after he says that we have to kill them all, you see Tara kind of squirming. She's like, like you could see in her face, man, I, I just went from one psychopath to there. another. Later on in the episode, and I, I, I never really remembered the words that she used, and I thought it was to Morgan on the side. And maybe it may well have been in some other episode. I don't know, but at least in this one, I, get, I may have gotten it wrong. But he, t- he talks to Gabe and Jesus, who happened to be in the car, which is very interesting. The father, son, the holy, what the fuck is shit am I doing about to do at the satellite station? Literally, that's the, this is the episode where they killed a bunch of people at the satellite station. And she admits... Uh, I, I lied to my girlfriend because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I have been here before, you know, I have done this before what I'm about to do. I say this because I continued watching the episode and uh, I see Gabe start to be the Gabe that we see now because the, the savior is, on the, is, is lying on the floor and saying, hey, you're going to say a prayer for me, father. And then he cites scripture and then blah, 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 and then he puts him down and he goes, amen. <laughs> like, you know, like some sort of badass scene, but I do see him later saying a prayer for somebody as they're burying him. And then we come to this episode and he's doing the same thing again. I feel like we're, we're mirroring things with Gabe or we're kind of doing the same thing that he's, he's, he's done before um, where he buries the dead and he says a prayer and then he'll cite scripture and kill someone. And I think he's meeting in a way, I think Gabe is meeting the him that could have been had he not gave a shit about people, had people not spared him and, and had mercy on him. Could he have been this ultra violent gang of people who thinks that they have to wipe out everybody, including all of Maggie's people? He had to bury just now one of Maggie's people. Uh, and so is this who I could have been? The same guy saying the same prayer? What am I becoming? I don't know. I'm putting a lot of thoughts into Gabe's head, maybe, but I just keep thinking how spooky it is. The same prayer. Does that shake Gabe out of things, does it, or does that further convince him to be a thing? I don't know. Could it also maybe make Gabe look at, um, maybe not all the Reapers, but this guy in particular as Def- more human? You right, know, like right. I, he can relate to this person. Yes, 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 yes. Which yes. was probably why he couldn't kill him. Just like Leah couldn't kill that family. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yin and yang. Mm, seeing, seeing yourself in someone else. It's hard mm-hmm. to kill that person, isn't it? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you one more yin yang that I know of. This is like, I'm like, I'm like trying to empty the, the bladder right now, like <laughs> this right now, just so I can look at my notes later. But like, there's one more scene, and it, it's right before the hard talk that Negan has with Maggie. And they're mirroring each other. Maggie comes and they're both sitting down at the same time. They're both holding the plates of food with their right hand outstretched in the same way. Mm-hmm. They're sitting down at the same time. They're not mirroring exactly. Otherwise, Maggie would have it in, left, in her left hand, but it's this yin-yang, the right hand, the right hand. And then 
they're wearing opposite colors though. You know, so like Maggie's wearing the general reds and Negan is wearing the blues. And it's, I just like when I see visual representations of, I am of you, but I am not you. And yet they're both failed leaders who are about to enter their sanctuary again to see what's what, see what, see what's going on there. Negan originally tried to go back to the sanctuary to see, yeah, maybe I can, you know, escape this, this prison here that I just escaped from and then just go out there and try to make it on my own. And then uh, he couldn't, he realized he couldn't. You know, is this what's going to happen now? Clearly not. Clearly Maggie's, Maggie's having a better go of it, but only because Negan is with her, I think. Could Maggie have even thought of a, a, a plan quite like that had Negan not been embedded with the Whispers? No, he wouldn't know how to do it either. It's like you had to take the tactics of your enemies in order to defeat a, a greater enemy. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, <laughs> I mean, in a way, you could see the Reapers as like advanced saviors. Because I mean, no matter what we tried to do, we couldn't beat them. Or I'm not we, I, I would never have be beaten them. But like our, our group, our survivors couldn't beat them. But this is them taking the, their, their, their pa the, all their shit experiences in the past and then using it to defeat a bigger enemy. To defeat an enemy that killed all my people so I can keep my promise. Or so that Elijah could keep his promise too. That well, one, leave him for me. That's that's a pretty epic way to end a series, right? Take all the things that we've learned from all of our enemies over all the years and use that to defeat the biggest, baddest enemy that we have. Right, or the scariest at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it just keeps get, getting scarier, yeah. right? Like, because the, well, the enders from fear and then, the, yeah, and then oh, okay, but, but the Reapers are scarier than them. <laughs> the Reapers are terrifying yeah. because they're trained. They're trained killers. These aren't people who just picked up a weapon and taught themselves. They were killers before the apocalypse and trained. they have faith <laughs> yeah and now they have faith on their side so you got that little but little fear removal the whispers were terrifying because they had the numbers but the reapers they have the skill and the know-how and they are capable of having right. a small crew and doing just as much damage i think do you think they could recruit some of the reapers to fight the crm since they are trained mm. and they know how to do military tactics or the Commonwealth. Which is Isn't to say, can we pull any of them away from Pope's grasp mm -hmm. or Pope's influence? Well, do I mean, you if they take Pope out, then wouldn't maybe they just necessarily oh. join another group? So you take Pope sure. out and then you have this whole, uh, you have a basically a little army that knows how to do military things. Yeah. So so hold up. I hadn't seen this before. Well, I think we're just having a moment right now. I'll tell you <laughs> why. For all we, all the talk about who takes on the Dwight role, we never talked about who takes on the Sherry role. Because if, if you're looking at Sherry as leader of the saviors and, and sort of like that kind of, okay, this is sort of like the comic book, but not, isn't Leah kind of representative of that? Like if you think about it, fucking Pope, if she takes Pope out and becomes the leader of this Reaper gang, I just literally acknowledge without thinking this, that they kind of seem like a more way more advanced saviors like okay we'll sp we're not sparing any he, negan is describing what the saviors would have been I mean, first of all they wouldn't be called save yours um mm -hmm. they would have been called up yours but they, they, <laughs> but he would have he meant they would have killed them all it's what the saviors would have been had they ran their natural course like okay we kept sparing them we kept sparing them but maybe we should have killed them maybe we should have killed them all and enter the reapers right and so this advanced saviors should naturally go to the replacement Sherry in Leah, let's say. I, I'm not saying exactly, of course, but like, you know, Leah seems competent. Leah at least has a grasp on this Pope. You seem to be a bit extreme. You know, you seem to be a bit much. I can lead these people better. They still respect me. They should be thankful for what you did back there. Like they, they know, she knows her family, you know, and, and she clearly, it would be just as much respect if they took Pope out. So I don't know. I'm just thinking of like these little parallels, these little nods to the comics that we can actually take and just remix a little bit. Especially because Dwight is kind of like a shadow of Daryl. Okay, that's all I want to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. see that. I actually think it would be um, insulting to for Leah to take Sherry's comic book role because it was so underwhelming and unimportant. But what if we made it important? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean... Then it, then it wouldn't be Sherry's storyline. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like taking Rick's hand. Like, okay, God, why did you do that? Oh, now we can't take yeah. it back. Are you trying to say we need to make Leah kill some horses or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, not literally this version or, of sherry or you or you want to see you want to see leah trip and hit her head on a table and die from Th that that's, that's what, what i'm saying see like, so like, oh, yeah that's yeah. how she goes out yeah well, but, yeah but like yeah. okay what if you take what could have been sherry right <laughs> like this kind of competent badass leader but also like that has a heart 
I mean, Sherry in the comics didn't have a heart. Whatever. That's fine. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to think of like, she does kind of, I see her as a, in a, I see her as a leader. I can see, you can easily see that happening. Okay. I would feel That's more comfortable. I would feel more comfortable equating Leah's storyline with comic book Andrea. How's that? Oh, okay. Well, well describe what Andrea went on to do, if anything, as a leader. Andrea was a huge part of making um, Alexandria, and she was an even bigger part in leading um, the the big herd away. Comic book Andrea was badass. I mean, she was awesome. She really was. I mean, she stepped up and got shit done. So, hmm. so what if you I, I mix? Mean, what if you remix the best parts of? Well, not the best parts, but like some parts of Andrea and some parts of Sherry. And I mean, because obviously the Reapers, they they kind of suck. They'll probably suck, continue to suck, but not as badly. <laughs> Under under Leah, but like, yeah. and then that you get like that little bit of righteousness from from Andrea, and that little bit of badassery of like being a, a good leader of a of a settlement or something. I don't know. I'm just trying to. Sherry was more like a loud mouth bitchy leader. I don't know if I would call her badass in the comics. Mm. Honestly, mm, I mean okay. she just sort of she just sort of picked up the pieces after the saviors fell. And stuff yeah, like after that. everything yeah. fell, she's like, okay, guys, listen to me now. Right. And then she shows up at Alexandria bitching up a storm and Rick's like, let's go talk for a minute. And then they go talk and then she trips and falls and hits her head on the table and dies. Wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then poor Rick has to come out and tell everybody what happened and Dwight's like, you killed her. So yeah. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> lame, isn't it? It, it was very <laughs> lame. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. So I hope, I, I hope Sherry gets a better ending on the show. I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I hope well, Leah gets a better ending TV too. Sherry or Leah? Leah Sherry. <laughs> Both. Both. Yeah, both. I, I both. agree. I mean, after seeing Leah in this episode, I, I really do want her to come out on top. And I feel like they're going to just... I, I on top of Daryl? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what she said. Yes. With Jack Nicholson rubbing his hands together. I have to describe the face I'm giving to the podcast listeners. Yes. I can't believe I just said that. You just said what I was thinking. So. Shake hands. I, Shake I hands. saw it all over your face, so I said it out loud. I was like, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> I, respect, I got you. I, I respect got both you. of you. I respect both of you for you uh, doing it and you not doing it. <laughs> Talk I have about the yin and the yang. Yeah. 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 yeah, I see it. I see it. Yeah, it's really good. All right. I mean, we should yin, we, listen. We could yin stop and right here. Like and a we'll couple have. of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Sixty-nine, everybody. I say the quiet oh. part out loud. How do we always? <laughs> talk about how do we always get back on this subject <laughs> how have we never said 69 on the podcast i don't know i don't know yeah <laughs> i don't think we ever have to be honest with you <laughs> uh look i'm i'm fine with leah as long as she doesn't come between carol and daryl's friendship oh i don't think that's possible no i don't think so at all carol doesn't seem to have a problem with leah because she has talked about oh, her no. Right. oh no yeah. she knows okay, it. Cool. she knows about yeah. her so yeah, i mean yeah. i don't see why encouraging guess, connie i mean but no. does leah know about carol no mm. and i don't think and so the relationship because the, I'm, my feeling is like does leah does not know that daryl came from another right i think she, she, she doesn't know alone. generally knows but like i but i think she i don't think she knows at all that he she thinks he was with maggie's group like i don't think she knows anything about the alexandria group well from the she way does, she's talking she does mention his family. Remember, he was talking about his family, and but he cleared that up right away and said, "Well, my family picked the fight, picked the wrong fight with the wrong people. So whatever family he did have, whatever family he did tell her about at the cabin, I think she's assuming is now dead." Okay. Right, and, he, yeah. and he's been on his own for since right. however long right. since then. Right. Yeah, because isn't that what you, do you think that was what he was getting ready to tell her when they when they got the radio call? Yes, something. Yeah, yeah. For sure. I think he was going to come clean. Yeah. I gotta Eric, tell you Eric something. Caught the same thing. And then radio. Yeah, we yeah. gotta go back right now. And why do they have to go back? Because um, the I horns think, coming. Well, that or oh, okay. like, or preacher guy went back and told them that they that he found people. He so saw they Gabe. had to come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Things, I'm, I'm yeah. glad we thought two different things on that one because I, I I thought well I mean of course they can't tell if the horns coming because it's too far away. Hmm. Unless they have patrol Unless they have luck. They it. Yeah, which they do. We know that they do. Yeah. So. Mm. Oh, this is so exciting. I can't, I can't wait to see and what lookouts. happens next. You know, they might have lookouts on higher buildings mm -hmm. that can see a ways. I got tall I, the, guys yeah. and short places. Woo! Short guys and tall places. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Father, you have guided me through the darkest of times and I treasure our conversation. I just want to read this out loud. Just cause Keep doing it like that, though. In the guidance <laughs> you have given me, is there anything I should know? There's a guy behind the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> Look behind 
you, dummy. <laughs> what was that, father? Thank you, father. <laughs> That's <all> right. <laughs> I ad libbed. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, it hadn't occurred to me how ironic it was that Tommy had the lottery festooned all over his his bake shop when he was hiding from the lottery. Like he was hiding from the ability to 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 enter the upper echelons of the Commonwealth society. But it's mm -hmm. just, it just, or maybe it's a good smokescreen, albeit you know, okay, more power to him. But I just again, there's like a little irony here, right? There's like he's trying to hide from greatness. Uh, meanwhile, he's he's festooned with the ability to obtain greatness. Did anybody else think that Tommy was uh, kidnapped to check out Zeke? I, does that line up? Uh, I think they just grabbed him because um, oh. Hornsby needed him for his plan. I think someone overheard Miko call it, saying he was a doctor, and we know he's a thoracic surgeon. She said that in her interview. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Ezekiel needs. Th a thoracic surgeon treats lung and esophageal cancer. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. He, that's who Ezekiel needs. Mm. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. Good call. I applaud you. Good sir. Good madam. Good, good, <laughs> good person. Good person. Just something, just something to kind of tuck in the back of your mind. No, it deserves a moment of silence. It's genius. <laughs> it's genius. I want to know what kind of drugs they gave him. Right? I want some of those. <laughs> because they automatically turned him back to Kingdom Ezekiel voice. Did you notice mm -hmm. that? Mm-hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. right, because th that's yeah. why you were saying that, right? <laughs> I'm on the most wonderful drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, now here's the question. Okay, did he do that because he feels fantastic? And that could be, and maybe we're making too big a thing of this. Or did he do that because he's... Again, like, remember what we were saying about why we thought he was the Dwight role is because he knows what it means to guide it, to fake it until you make it, mm -hmm. which is all about what the Commonwealth is struggling to be. It's like the only reason why we're here is because we're faking it. This is all fake. This is all fake. <laughs> this, this stupid book on this stupid coffee table, it's fake. This dumb telephone, which by the way is dumb. <laughs> it's fake. She's not talking to anybody. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so no, what do you think is going on here with Ezekiel? With Ezekiel? Did Lance kind of worm his way into his ear? Did he play the serpent settler? Spoke some partial tongue in his ear. Or maybe he's, oh, maybe he's like, maybe he's like Carol, like with the cookies and trying to play Su Susie Homemaker. He's trying to play mm -hmm. the Carol role. Could be. I wonder what's going to happen when they find out what this actually is going on here. I mean, are they going to care? Are they even going to, he lied about it in their interview. So are his lies going to be called out? Do they even care? I'm thinking more about that. Yeah, what happens when the that. truth comes out? Yeah. yeah, we talked about in the last episode, like what they would think if he lied, you know, what would they would do? Would they do nothing? Right. Oh, I you mean, lied to us so many times. Right. His options are tell the truth and basically, you know, admit that you lied about what this thing is or you say nothing and then die from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder. What do you think, uh, Charity? Like, what do you think about Zeke's sudden putting out of the kingdom King Ezekiel voice? <laughs> I think he was on good drugs. <laughs> Made him feel better. Well, I mean, yeah. he's been feeling really bad. As you can see, he was struggling to breathe. He was struggling to move. Cessation of pain, thinking that you might have a future and you might not die from this after all. Like, I mean, I can see why he was just exuberant and happy. Like, he, like yeah, I have a Felt chance, great. man. And right. it was good and, drugs. <laughs> they yeah, haven't, that's what, they yeah. haven't had drugs in a long time. Oh my god, he must feel amazing. <laughs> Painkillers? Oh my goodness. This hey, is way better yeah. than the aspirin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Carson. <laughs> I mean, rest in peace, too. Yeah. Here, here's some aspirin on your grave. We have tons of it. Peace. Oh. Yeah, poor Carson. <laughs> Both the Carsons. I'm with Princess being um, anti-friends dying from stubbornness. Mm. Yep. Yeah. You yeah. might have to. You might have to watch me. <laughs> I, might, I might kill myself with the, with the way I run this damn podcast. Right. I just drank a whole bottle of vodka, so watch out. <laughs> <laughs> you better be feeling everybody. as good as Ezekiel, then. <laughs> Nobody feels as good as Ezekiel. Nobody. Right. That's what Carol said. Ooh. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love what he says to Leah when she's finally done defending her people. Her, her two guys are saying, they're trying to best the best they can. What the, what are you doing? She goes, take your boy over there and go find my enemies. And it got me thinking, like, this guy must not know how to be, be without having an enemy. That's how fucked up he is. Mm. Like this kind of like PTSD driven thing. Like you, I mean, that's typically what people come home. They don't know how to be unless there's something to fight against. 
Mm-hmm. So when they come home and they don't have anything to do, it's just that now they have to actually think about what they've done. So now I'm now I'm wondering when they're going to bring that humanity into our enemy and get to kind of see how he became the man he became. First of all, they're going to have to show us more shit and then, then crank it back. Wait, 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 wait. Are you asking for a flashback right now? No, it could be like okay. a side conversation or like, you know. <laughs> Good night, everybody. If you like what you heard. <laughs> For those who don't know, because we have to do this every once in a while. Yeah. For those who don't know, I don't approve because The Walking Dead, until here's Negan, and they barely did it. And see, I'm making excuses now. I know I'm making excuses. <laughs> they hadn't really done pre apocalypse flashbacks. You know, like there was right at the fall or with the Alpha's backstory. It was right, it was happening. There's alarms going off, and they're like, oh, people are eating other people. Oh, it's crazy. But. No pre-apocalypse flashbacks. So when she except from Michonne, and even then it was like a mangled hallucinatory. Yeah. So it wasn't really a flashback. We don't know exactly. It could have been like jumbled memories. Yeah, yeah. Or even like a a dream sequence where it kind of takes a memory you have had and be like, okay, this is what you had, but it's not real. Anyway, so ha, there you go. True. Yeah. Another exception. So anyway, so (laughs) yeah, no pre. So but I, I. but I wonder, I wonder when they're going to bring the humanity, because they must at some point bring the humanity in. They have to humanize this, this enemy at you some You think point. so? That's what they always do. Do they, <laughs> they, do they the have to, though? Season, they don't have to do anything. Yeah, they could flip the script. And, and just Throw go it complete out. evil. Throw right? it out the window. Yeah. But the, I, I do, it is it is kind of sneaking up on me, like how, you know, like how does somebody become this fucked up? And manage in his fucked upness to get a bunch of people to follow him now you got me bothered do you want to feel sympathy for for the last enemy we're gonna see i'll say i'll say this much and you're gonna feel the same way as me okay and i'll tell you why first of all let me dial it back and go did you not almost laugh when richie coster playing pope (laughs) went in and out of blue and then back to his normal accent he was yelling at his his compadres right did you hear that like yeah (laughs) Yeah. Okay, good. Did you laugh a little? Like, she's like, oh my God, I can barely do it. Because he's losing his control of his yeah. voice. I don't know if I laughed, but I definitely heard heard a little back and forth there. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go straight to you because I know you know, because I know you've watched it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, happy. Um, we're talking about Happy on Sci Fi. So good. Go oh, yeah. watch it. Yes, go, go watch, watch it. it. I mean, tread, can tread lightly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's it's, it's, it's a ridiculous, show. yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous, violent, and gory. But yep. it's a show. <laughs> All of that. He plays Blue Scaramucci, blah blah blah, and he has this kind of like New York accent, and he kind it kind of breaks in, and then he goes back to his English accent, and then he I finally swear. goes back to his Southern accent. He makes his own accent. Like there is no <laughs> accent like Richie Coster. Like it's just his own dialect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I say all this because, given the actor, when they start pulling. The humanity you kind of you want to see you want to see what he does with it you want to see the man he he'll end up becoming that may flip it's not going to flip the script it's not going to change the way you feel it's going to be a look at the flowers moment like you see how sad it is that mika is <clears throat> giving the walkers names but you're like what do we do about this kid what do we do about this kid we can't do anything about this kid she's gonna keep killing other kids <laughs> so like like judith so and then you see the humanity and in, in, in pope and maybe you'll even get his whole name maybe he's not called pope at all but maybe he's called yeah. blue scaramucci <laughs> like, <laughs> and, he, and his southern accent is completely fake yeah kind of like I, I see what i see what you're saying it it would be very exciting to see this to see the actor go go into all of this now mm, yeah. as a viewer and a fan yeah. of the walking dead i don't know i don't know if it would, I would be a waste to. though i yeah i don't know if i would want to and here's this is my my thought process and i could be totally wrong because sometimes i just go totally fangirl and throw story out the window but <laughs> I got, but i love for the, the people <laughs> I do, I do. But for the final, final season, I wouldn't mind at all if this last bad guy was just pure evil. Don't I, don't mm. even humanize him. Don't show me a human side. I don't want to feel bad <laughs> when we defeat him, mm. right? Like, I, I don't want to feel sympathy when we take this guy out because it's the last one. I want to go out knowing we did the right thing and not <laughs> <Finally>. questioning <laughs> our actions. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so- See? 
see that this is just my fangirling. Like right. that's what I would. Yeah. But, uh, I, but I feel as a that. fan, yeah. But as a fan of Richard Coster, yes, I would love to see him open this role up more. Yeah. I, to- I, I totally see what it. you mean. I totally see what you mean. Only because, but you have to contend with two, with like the two sides of the story. Like, do you want? Uh, you know, oh, it's oh, it's an implacable evil, and then you then you bring in the new humanized Negan. Oh, fuck. Or yeah. or now here we are. <laughs> or do you want like? It, it, but it, the, it's the difference between that and having like a short ass terminus after like the road to terminus lasting almost a, an entire season. You get to terminus and it's over before you know it. Mm-hmm. Would you rather have that? Because that was a bit a bit weak sauce. <sighs> It's, it's like the vultures, like almost. Well, we could we could do a little bit of a little bit. Of I, well, no, well, no, I don't. I mean, I don't want it to like end so abruptly, but drag out the action a little more, and I'll be fine with that. Yeah, oh, I'd okay, be cool with that. Yeah, we gotta find a good mix to this terminus. Yeah. <laughs> terminus subplot. I mean, I don't mind if the the dreadfully evil guys end up getting defeated at some point, but but my problem with it is it, it's got to be good because it takes the the weight off of them slaughtering Maggie's people a little bit. It takes a little bit of those weights off. It's got to be, they have to be hard to beat, <laughs> sorry, and, yeah. and and they have to have a little bit more of a story so that when you do beat them, yeah, it's you, you stand up and cheer. And at the same time, you kind of like Father Gabriel to the other Reaper whom he didn't grant mercy and prayers. You kind of, at the end of it, you want to be the Gabriel that did do that. That like said, it sucks that, that these people had to get to a point where they had to be this person. The person that Negan said, I didn't have the balls to become and say a prayer for them anyway. Say a prayer for my enemy. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. Yeah. Like, I, I, I'm, I feel like a, it's like the Walking Dead. <laughs> Let's see, let me tell you why I like The Walking Dead. Because it makes me feel like I'm a good person. <laughs> I, think, I think so. A little bit. Like, oh, they're painting a very morally gray world. I know I'm way more righteous than that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a in little, this world, yeah. anyway. a little bit, a li- yeah, a little bit. In this bit. world, anyway. Meanwhile, we're, in that world, you may not be. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah, e- exactly. And we we discover this on Morning Squaffy, so let's back away. <laughs> so like, Bitch, this apocalypse. We care about sweet potatoes. God damn it! You're never gonna know where that's from, not unless you've watched all the Morning Squaffies. Morning Squaffy, I remember those. There's a playlist out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> They're still there. They're still there. I have to say, I really. I'm really liking where this is going. I like how how f- so many parallels, so many tie-ins, so many displays of the yin yang differences and similarities between people. I, I can't wait to see what comes next. I really cannot. I I it's been a long time since I felt this way. Like, you know, I'll tell you what. You know what? Fear of the Walking Dead season six was a little bit like this, and now I'm feeling that for the Walking Dead again. I know it sounds awful. Listen, the new girlfriend is always a little bit more exciting than the old girlfriend. Okay, <laughs> so, I'm sorry. This is just the truth that we have to we, we have to dispel. You know that we have to we have to disseminate far and wide. It's it's the mysteries there, right? Fear of the Walking Dead. We don't know what's gonna happen next. Anyway, if you like what you heard, head over to ratethispodcast.com/slash/walkingdead. Five stars and an eggplant is all we need to know that you love us. However, if you want to say something more, you want to tell us what we got right, what we got wrong, if you want to add a fact that we didn't say, but also say cool things about us at the same time, do it. It's a great way to communicate to not just others that we're worth watching, but to our, to us, to communicate with us, to let us know that we're doing something right or wrong, or F you, Squawking Dead, you should be canceled. Tell us, <laughs> or tell the world. It helps. It helps them from not watching us, aka they will watch us because they want to know what happens next. But if you really, really want to become part of the family, just head over to ko-fi.com, create an account, and follow us at ko-fi.com slash squawking dead. When you do, you know when we record so that you can be there in the chat, just like Aiden was and Aliza was earlier, as well as get the unedited episode recordings. Now, if you're following us, you're not going to get them right away. But if you decide, hey, you know, I kind of want to be a part of that conversation because I really have something to say about this episode, or you want to get the unedited episode recordings to see when how many times I fucked up this, this outro <laughs> <laughs> just now. <laughs> <laughs> but also with some personal conversations, some behind the scenes discussions that we do before, after, and sometimes during that get cut out completely. I know that when you get the unedited episodes, it's because you want to know who we are as people, because you want to know all the mistakes we're making, but it means you want to get a little closer to us. And that's reason enough. So if you feel like doing it, tip us $3, you'll get 30 days of access of supportive back content. And 
if you're so inclined, for just as a dollar a month, you can get all those things, you know, all so many features for free perpetually. And if you're even more inclined, you can join our upper tiers, our whisperers tier, where you get credits in the episode, 50% off the merch store, and access to our Discord, as well as the ability to be with us on our Jackbox streams on Twitch, to be with us on camera. But if you're really, really Fun dedicated. times. Yeah. But just like Eliza, Jay, and Whispers UK, you could be a Survivors tier member, which means you get the ability to host on the show with us. Now, Eliza couldn't be here because she's not feeling that well. And Darren is actually in a different time zone. So we have to figure that one out a little bit better. But you can join the show. We have three spots left. They're very expensive. But see how you know. See how you feel about it. If you feel like you can do this too, if you feel like you have something to say, let us know and you can join that tier and you can get all these benefits or not and just do it anyway and then you could be in our discord and enjoy the conversations and some of the behind the scenes posts and memes that we post in our discord it's a fun place to be <laughs> uh, i've been your host david cameo joined by cosmo mz09 rachel burt and charity aka blazy gardener and with that everybody Ooh. thank you for joining us have a great night or day whenever you're listening or watching this bye until the next one Thank you so much for making it to the end of this episode, the seventh in the seventh episode in the final season of The Walking Dead, titled Promises Broken. This episode has been brought to you by our Survivors tier members at Eliza Jones71, at Whispers UK, and at Jasmine.iac, all on Instagram. But this episode has also been brought to you by our Whispers tier members at Judith.morton on Instagram, at snick.3 on Instagram and Twitter, as well as a at Aiden the Raven on Twitter. Well, what are tier members? Tier members are tier, tier members are started off following us on ko-fi.com slash squawking dead and eventually decided, well, some of them quicker than others, that we were worth supporting. It's a platform that you can use to support this podcast, but you you don't it's not like you don't get anything back in return. We, we often post, post links to our recording sessions for you to join us in the real-time chat, as well as the ability to download those unedited episode recordings once those recordings are through. But there's a whole bunch of other perks and tier memberships, one of which, you know, the starting is the Walkers tier, which you can join for just a dollar a month. But my biggest concern is that you all follow us there so you know when things are happening, and if you do want to pounce on something, you can just tip us when you do you will get 30 days of supporter back content for you to see all the unlocked posts that would normally be locked and join us in those recordings and get those unedited episodes and all the other benefits like joining our Discord, which we will be eventually releasing and giving the ability to Walker Walker tier members to also join in on the Discord fund. Uh, previously, it was just Whisper tier members and higher, and then come the end of this month, uh, we should be all all membership tiers should have access to our discord server with varying degrees of operability and we've been having a lot of fun on our discord server as well so I, I highly encourage you to join a membership tier but you don't have to do anything just follow us there so you know what's 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 going on what's happening and that's really it if you like what you heard Rate us at ratethispodcast.com slash walking dead. Five stars and neckline is all we need to know that you love us. But please rate us after every episode. Let us know what we got right. Let us know what we did wrong. Let us know if you, we should be canceled. Let the world know. Um, give us no stars and five poop emojis. Whatever you got to do to let people know how, how vociferously you feel for us. Do it. Please. Every episode. It helps. And until next time, speak to you soon. Thank you.